roll meeting will come to order. Regular meeting February 28th. Please call the roll. Councilmember Story? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Councilmember Brooks? Here. Councilmember Bator? Here. And Mayor Bertrand? Here. Pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for, for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good idea. I think we have a presentation from Santa Cruz Metro. Welcome, Cliff. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, council members, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and, and present uh, on behalf of Metro our annual State of Metro. I'm Alex Clifford, the CEO at Metro, and I always like to start off with a few facts. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Bottorf knows all these facts by heart. He probably could do them for me. But I'll go ahead and I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Metro in our budget. Um, our operating budget is uh, 50 million dollars this year. We employ about 319 people at Metro. We own 98 fixed route and commuter buses that operate on 26 routes. Uh, we also have 41 paratransit vehicles. Um, they, they, uh, in, in all of our service area, which is the entire county, about 264,000 people. Um, we provide 5 million fixed route trips per year and about uh, 72,000 paracruise, what we call paracruise, paratransit service uh, per year. Interesting to note that about 50, 50 percent of our service is students and faculty from UCSC oh. and students from Cabrillo College. Uh, so that's a, that's a really massive part of our service, um, being in a college town and all. Um, so how do we fund all of that? Well, uh, passenger fares, that is what the the uh, customers put in the fare box that covers right around 20 percent of the operating costs uh, a little over 46 percent of the costs are covered by a 1978 half cent sales tax that's dedicated to us in perpetuity and our share of the measure d which is about 16 percent of the total uh, measure d that comes in so that covers about 46 percent of the cost another 13 percent a little over that is state operating funding including the new SB1 funding, and I'll talk about that in a moment. About 8.5% is federal operating assistance, and a little over 11% is what we call capital eligible funds that we use, um, uh, which are state transit assistance and a program out of the federal government called the Small Transit Intensive Cities Program, or STIC as we call it. And then just under 2%, the remaining is leases and advertising and some other miscellaneous revenue that we cobbled together. Um, so all of that pays for everything. Um, the really nice thing for me to be able to say to you this year that I haven't been able to say in my past previous presentations is not only have we resolved our structural deficit, but we're now in a really good place where we have a five-year projection for a balanced budget. And that's pretty cool. We haven't been there in a very long time. And on top of that, that balanced budget provides about $3 million a year for us to address our capital needs. So that's, that's, again, a really good place for Metro to be, a good solid foundation. You know, we talked about SB1. I always like to acknowledge uh, the gratitude to the voters uh, in your community, in the Santa Cruz County, and across the state in having rejected uh, um, Prop 6. And, and, uh, and I know that was important to you for your local streets and roads. And uh, SB1 staying in place was important to us because we were so dependent on that new funding. And, of course, that's what helped us cobble together the dollars to create that foundation I just talked to you about so that we're stable for at least the next five years. So I talked a little bit about the capital needs and, and they are pretty great and that, that's what we're turning our focus to now. Uh, out of our 98 buses that we have, about 50% of those buses need to be replaced. They're just past their useful life. We have great mechanics, they do a wonderful job keeping old buses running, but it's time to replace at least 50% of our buses. We're still running a number of 1998 diesel buses. Now we're an agency that in, in about 2002 started buying compressed natural gas buses, but we just haven't been able to get rid of those final diesel buses. So we look forward to that occurring. But that's an expensive proposition. Um, if we buy compressed natural gas buses, then that's about $38 million. If we buy zero emission buses, which is where we are going in the future, that's, that's a lot more, that's about $50 million. So that $3 million a year I talked about that the board is setting aside has to be leveraged. We have to use that money 
to a go after grants and try to leverage $3 million into buying as many buses as we possibly can. That's how we will catch up in the coming years. And as you may or may not know, the California Air Resources Board at, in December of this last year adopted a new regulation that requires by 2040 that all transit properties across the state of California be 100% zero emission buses, all electric buses. And for us, uh, given the size of our property, that means that starting in 2026, mandatorily we must buy 25% uh, of whatever we buy as zero emission buses. And then from 2029 on, 100% of whatever we buy must be zero emission buses. So given the price tag I just showed you, uh, the cost of buying buses are gonna get uh, pretty expensive. Now, I talked about how many buses we needed to replace. Um, we, we have a, a great friendship and partnership with Santa Clara VTA through the Highway 17 commuter service. And you may have seen in December, we had a big old celebration. Um, we, we received from them 10 diesel electric buses. So diesel electric, nice, consumes far less um, diesel than a, a full-fledged diesel bus does and puts out far fewer particulate matter than, than the other pieces of equipment. Um, so those 10 diesel electrics will be used on the Highway 17 service, which is a partnership with Amtrak, Caltrans, mm -hmm. Santa Clara VTA. And they also gave us four articulated buses that we'll use for the UCSC service. Um, service demands in the peak hour are so high on the UCSC routes that we needed bigger equipment, and these articulated 60-foot buses will do the job. Now, they were tough negotiators, but we were equally tough, and I, I have to tell you that we paid a, a, a large sum of money for these buses at $1 a piece. So <laughs> uh, it was a bargain we couldn't pass up. Uh, in addition to that, we cobbled together several grants in the last year, and we're ordering four Proterra 100% zero emission buses. So we're not waiting for the mandate to kick in. We, we're, we're putting our toe in the water. We're gonna have four zero emission buses on the property sometime early next year. We're in the process of designing the electrical uh, charging infrastructure that we need on our property. Uh, but we'll have a big celebration of that when those arrive, and I hope you'll join us in that celebration early next year. And then later this year, uh, again, as a result of uh, the success of SB1, um, Caltrans was able to fund the STIP at a much higher level than anticipated, and we were the benefactor of some of that money, and that's funding uh, automatic vehicle location on our buses. We don't have that, we will have that. And what that will do for our customer-facing product, that'll allow the customers to use their smartphone and to see where that bus is. And if that bus is running late, they don't have to go stand at that stop. They can just monitor that bus and stay at their desk working, stay at home and have another cup of coffee, stay on campus and do some more homework, whatever they're doing, and then go meet that bus when the bus is gonna arrive. That's really cool. On our side, the business side, that'll produce just pipelines of data that we'll use in order to manage the system much better and improve our on-time performance. So we're excited about that. And then another area of technology that we're launching uh, later this year is on the Highway 17. We're launching, we're launching a pilot project, again involving the smartphone, in which the customers on Highway 17 will be able to purchase their fare media on a smartphone application. So we're gonna test that out. If that pilot project goes well, it could be expanded at a future date to the rest of the system. Um, everybody's got a smartphone these days and that seems to be where it's going and that also helps us board our customers much quicker if we have that kind of fair media as opposed to putting dollar bills in the fare box which slows the service down. Coming back to being a little bit more specific to Capitola, um, well, maybe just a quick nugget. Our ridership in our system is relatively flat and that in the face of nationwide trending which in the last year has been down 2% nationwide. We're relatively flat. What sort of undergirds us and helps us to do a little bit better is our service ridership grows as the college grows. So that's been helping us considerably. Your routes, so for example, routes serving Capitola that are performing well. Route 69A, which does not serve Ca uh, Cabrillo, but 69W does, um, both operating between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. That's a, that's a really good set of routes there. Um, they're operating at about 26 to 31 passengers per trip. Uh, as, as transit goes, that's a pretty good number when you're operating at that, that level. Your Route 66 and 68 operate between Capitola Mall and downtown Santa Cruz via Live Oak. Good steady ridership in the 15 to 20 passengers per trip. That's still a good line. And then Route 55, which operates between Capitola and Rio Del Mar via Pacifica, um, via Cabrillo College also decent ridership at 17 passengers per trip. So your, your routes are doing well on our system. 
In the way of disruption, you hear a lot about disruption these days. Um, transit's being disrupted, and, and we're having to learn to do things different. And so we're, we're investigating uh, the possibility of doing some a new service in the way of uh, using Lyft, Uber, taxis, any one of those combinations on, uh, to provide on-demand service to our customers. So customers that either don't have uh, a fixed route that service them, maybe it's in an area where in our uh, comprehensive operational analysis and the service changes that followed, maybe we contracted a little bit and pulled back. Could be late night, early morning kind of service. Any combination of those things might be candidates for on-demand. So we're studying that and we may in the, in the coming year present the board with some proposals that target the use of that kind of service that that is being experimented with transit properties across the nation right now. You all heard about the Unified Corridor Investment Study with the RTC. Of course, we participated heavily in that. And then that's moving to a next stage of an alternatives analysis, which will look at the railroad right of way and whether bus, uh, bus rapid transit, what we call BRT, could be used in that corridor or whether the passenger rail or some other concept might be a viable um, uh, use for mass transit in that corridor. So we'll participate in that. And also what the RTC Commission uh, said is they, they're going to allow us to work with RTC to identify what the potential impacts of whatever happens in that corridor in the way of mass transit might be on our service. Certainly whatever you build there has to be funded in some way, shape, or form. And we think if it's going to impact bus by moving money from bus to whatever that transit is, we should all know that up front when we're making those kind of key decisions before we make those decisions. We're also working with RTC on bus on shoulder concept on Highway 1. That's quite exciting for us, and we hope that will move a major step forward in the coming year. And then we're also seeking operational improvements on the SoCal Freedom Corridor. Um, Metro Board also started this, this last year and into this year their very first uh, business strategic plan. Um, it's a 10-year strategic plan. It has seven focus areas. Uh, those focus areas are safety first culture, financial stability, stewardship and accountability, service quality and delivery, internal and external technology, employment engagement, state of good repair, and strategic alliances. And of course, that's very high level, but we're, we're providing many more details for the, uh, the board in the coming year to finalize that plan. And then in closing, um, another new uh, long overdue uh, adventure for us is in the way of a customer survey. We're, we haven't done one in many years. We need to do one. This year we're scheduled to do an onboard customer survey probably in about spring. That's important to us because not only do we need to understand what our current customers think about our service and where they believe we need to make some changes, maybe it's in frequency of service, but we also need to understand a little bit more about people who don't ride the system and why they don't ride the system and what we can do to attract them to the system. So as you can see, um, Mr. Botorf has a busy year ahead of him uh, as chairman <coughs> of the Metro Board, and we're going to accomplish many good things, and, and we'll tell you more about it a year from now, too. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, questions of Clifford? I just had a comment. I just, I, you know, a Alex, I just want to make mention, you touched on in the beginning of your, of your uh, presentation that Metro, when you came on board, was in a structural deficit. And I just want to acknowledge uh, the job that you and your staff have done to turn that around and to make Metro uh, a positive force in Santa Cruz County. So thank you, for your, your team, and, and you for the work you've done. We appreciate that, and we had a, a great board to help get us there. Any other comments? Sam? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Alex, for being here and giving uh, us the update on the Metro. I just had a couple of questions, and you did talk uh, uh, Capitola specific about the fixed route, but I was wondering on the Paracruise, um, maybe how many uh, participants we have uh, uh, out of Capitola, um, either, and you know, if you have figures on drop off or pickups in Capitola, and, and just, I mean, not necessarily raw numbers, but trends mm -hmm. in Capitola, uh, um, and as well on uh, your participation with the RTC in the corridor study. Mm -hmm. um, any a sense of a timeline uh, of how that's going to move forward? Don't yet. We haven't had the first meeting with the RTC to design that entire process. Um, <coughs> my guess is we're talking probably at least you know nine months to a year, um, but we'll get that sorted out once we sit down at the table with them. Um, we want to move it along, I'm sure, as they do too. Um, Capitola, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a couple of notes and send you back some stats about paracruz service here. Right. Uh, you do have a lot of paracruz service that comes here, and uh, um, I'll get you back some good numbers on that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Alex. Sure. 
Oh. <laughs> I just had a couple of questions. The automatic location app and the pilot fair media um, program that you're going to be running, are those going to be free to the public to utilize on their phones? Yes. Or? Awesome. So the, the app will be free. Uh -huh. and, and then, of course, on the, uh, the pilot project on high se Highway 17, um, we hope to have that linked to something like their credit card so they can just go online, load it up with whatever <coughs> fare they want, and then they can just flash that media to the driver. Um, that hasn't gone out for bid yet, so we don't know quite 100% yet whether it be flash media or whether we'll have a device that they'll actually scan, like when you board a plane, for example, right. the barcode uh, does that. Um, and then, and then, of course, the the, the app for uh, um, vehicle location will be free too. And Great. we hope it'll be uh, widely accepted and used. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, Krista. Okay, I have a few questions. Um, so I found out uh, recently that um, the city of Santa Cruz is going to provide bus passes for uh, city workers. And I was just wondering if you could comment on how that's going to work and how much that's going to cost the community. Do you have any sense of that? Sure. Uh, so that our staff has been working with the uh, city of Santa Cruz for about a year now to come up with an eco pass type of a concept. Uh, the the goal is to provide some I think 4,000 employees in the downtown with free passes. And so this is a part of, of Santa Cruz's transportation demand management, their TDM strategy. And uh, that's to try to reduce the car trips coming into the downtown. So they've done some uh, increases, I think, in their parking fees, and they're funneling some of that money into this particular EcoPass program. <laughs> it looks like it'll be about a $300,000 program, and uh, we think that we probably receive from those downtown employees about $100,000 a year in in ridership mm -hmm. currently. Mm -hmm. So that the difference, the 200,000 we hope, we both hope, the city and us hope, will attract new riders to the system and out of their cars and taking our service to the downtown. So we, we have to now uh, design that over the next several months. We hope to uh, launch it maybe later this year, maybe in the fall of this year. It's going to take a little bit of time because we have to worry about how we distribute those, what is the fair media going to be, paper or plastic kind of media. And we have to work around what, what are the potential fraud issues associated with handing everybody a pass. Do they get used the way they're intended to be used? Could we do it for a confined area like along 41st or the mall? A high concentration of people working there. I think uh, the mall, for example, is probably a pretty cool opportunity if we could figure out how to, to get all of the employers in the mall to provide their employees with uh, a similar type of product. Okay, thank it can you. be adapted. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you are on a balanced budget. Um, has the emergency funds been re replenished? Because that was an issue before. That's a great question. So as you're recalling from my prior presentations when we had a deficit, once upon a time our agency was in a really good place and about had about $26 million in reserves. And then over the course of the years, it drew down those reserves to bridge the gap and have a balanced budget. So I'm happy to say we stopped drawing reserves down a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and last year we had such a good year <coughs> where we really managed our budget to well below the budget, and we had, a, we had a carryover at the end of the year. The board took that entire carryover and replenished all of the reserve buckets. They're all, they're all now at 100% of what they're scheduled to be at. I think Ed probably had something to do with that. <laughs> I have another question. In um, terms of the, um, the passes, I, I know there's a lot of traffic uh, going north that peels off to go to Dominican. Has there been any approach to Dominican? Because that would, I think, do a lot to relieve. Maybe if they went on SoCal using a bus. They're, they're really high on our list. Um, they are high on your we've list. We've had small talk with them, but we're trying to figure out how do we make a big inroad into Dominican because we think it's a great possibility. <coughs> You know, and and the the federal government has uh, adopted now permanently the the transit benefit in which employers can provide the the transit pass to their employees as a pre-tax benefit. So okay. it's really something we need to promote much more. And once I have a marketing person aboard, um, it hopefully in a couple of months, that's going to be one of the tasks that they'll go out and try to uh, do, which is to increase the use of that transit benefit. 
So this may be too early, but at one time, you know, we tried to uh, do a transit center at the mall here. Now we have new owners. Has there been any conversation? Do they know who you are? Can they approach you because of that? They do. Um, I think we're just waiting to hear if there's going to be more on that. Jamie will call me as soon as as soon as we do. Oh, uh, he will. Yep. Uh, we're we're ready to to go have those conversations. I know the last one evolved fairly well. We came up with a pretty decent design, I believe, over there by the Macy's side of the mall. Um, we can resurrect that at any time. We're we're ready to talk. So one of the perennial issues for capital is service to the mall and for the residents around here. So I understand you're going to have a strategic plan, as you mentioned. Um, are these issues going to be discussed? Can we bring those up on any public discourse or public involvement? Yeah, through the, the strategic plan uh, process, uh, of course, we can have you communicate uh, anything that you're hearing to uh, Council Member Bottorf, too, to bring into the process. But I, I envision that plan talking a little bit about unmet needs. Mm -hmm. um, now, we're in a place where our service is stabilized. We have this balanced budget. So I don't know when our financial condition will be in the right place to be able to start expanding service. Mm -hmm. But when, th we're, when we're ready to do that, we should have a list that's been prioritized that we can start doing um, or start chipping away with. And that can, th probably the number one thing is going to be frequency of service. I mean, we still have some areas where we have only one hour or even 30 minutes to 45 minutes service. We'd like to do better. Uh, we think if we have more frequent service in our corridor, we'll attract more riders. I agree. Any more questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. And as always, we always enjoy it. Thank you, too. And I'll send back a message on the paratransit ridership. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Super. Thank you so much. Okay, um, that's the only presentation. Do we have any additional materials? We received um, one public comment for item 8C, and there was a staff response to that. Okay, and at this point, I'd like to let everyone know that's listening that um, this meeting is cable cast live on Charter Communications channel um, 8. And it's also being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. On, on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. We also have it through the city website, which I use quite regularly. Our technician tonight is Lynn Dutton. So as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting and sign your name when you come up if you would like to be recorded during your um, presentation of your comments. So, any additions and deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes. Okay, thank you. So this is time for public comments. You have three minutes to make a comment on any item that is not on the agenda. Seeing none, let's go on to City Council staff comments on item. Anything that you want to bring up, City Council? I have a couple. Okay. Uh, I was appointed by this body to uh, serve again on the uh, committee. It was formerly known as the Select Committee, which was dealing with South Bay arrivals uh, for the jet noise uh, over Capitola and uh, Santa Cruz County. Um, I attended a meeting yesterday, and this uh, Select Committee for South Bay arrivals uh, would, is now being called the Santa Clara Santa Cruz Roundtable, and it's a combination of the Select Committee and a uh, committee in San Jose that was formed by San Jose, the city of San Jose and the airport for South Flow arrivals. Our first meeting was held uh, in San Jose with uh, 13 cities and the two counties being represented. Uh, the first business we dealt with was uh, bylaws and one of the items that was uh, contentious was some of the Santa Clara County and Santa Cruz County chose not to have an elected official, they chose to have the CAO represent uh, their body. Uh, the membership voted not to allow that to happen, that it had to be represented by uh, elected officials. Um, my concern is that this is a self-funded model for a committee, and uh, if, if we were to lose Santa Clara County and Santa Cruz County, that, that encompasses about 50% of the funding. So um, we're going to see how that, uh, they're going back to see how their, uh, their uh, supervisors are going to deal with that, and we have another meeting on March 27th. <coughs> So we haven't begun to address any of the jet noise, still trying to work through the uh, dynamics, and I'll keep uh, posted on that. And uh, item number two is, uh, um, earlier this week, Santa Cruz Police Department held a ceremony to commemorate the uh, sixth anniversary of the uh, brutal killing 
Sergeant Baker and Elizabeth, Butch Baker and Elizabeth uh, Butler. And I just wanna take a moment to recognize those two individuals, but the main reason I bring this up is I wanna uh, acknowledge the members of the Capitol Hill Police Department for the great job they do every day, day in and day out. Um, unfortunately, this job is becoming uh, more and more dangerous every day. I think we read about it almost every day where a police officer is either shot at uh, or involved in some kind of vicious shooting. So um, I think we all just need to know that when we go to bed at night, uh, don't think for a minute that things don't happen at Capitol here at night. And our officers always have to be uh, on watch. Uh, local news becomes national news, that's how it works. And so I just want this to council to let, I want the Capitol Police Officer to know that this council appreciates every police officer that is out there uh, taking care of the city, so thank you. Um, just to add to that, I think we all agree on that. Thank you. <laughs> and Sam. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to report on uh, the Arts Commission um, at our last meeting, which was a week from last Tuesday. Um, we have um, made the selections for the Twilight Concerts, uh, and as well, this Saturday, we're having uh, our annual retreat where we're going to be uh, making our plans about um, art, public art, um, uh, expenditures uh, over the next year. So if anybody has any ideas, please uh, email them to the Arts Commission. Um, and soon this council will be receiving the annual report uh, from uh, the Arts Commission coming up. Thank you, Sam. Any other comments? Yeah, Kristen? No. Um, so I was at the COE meeting last night and uh, had a presentation of the clean water um, program that the um, SoCal Water District is putting on. Barbara Graves did that presentation and then Tom came later to, he's on the board to answer some questions and it was interesting to find that Barbara Graves was the originator of our COE on Council on the Environment. That's my report. Any other comments from city staff? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, very quickly just wanted to report today I had a 911 board meeting up at regional 911 center and we actually approved a new cost sharing um, model. We update the cost sharing model every three years and this is the first time we've actually ever kind of really rethunk, sort of did a deep dive into the data and tried to think about what was the best way to divvy up costs. So it's kind of a big step for us up at 911 and uh, we will have a sort of minor reduction in capitalist contributions. So I think it, divvies up the cost a little more fairly among all the different participating jurisdictions. Steve also has a little update for us about what happened last night in Lower Pack Cove. I have oh to boy. turn on the slideshow for him. And we'll get there. While we're waiting for that, I will update you that we opened bids uh, this week on the speed tables uh, for Jade Street and 42nd Avenue, part of the jewel box traffic calming project. Uh, the low bid came in uh, at $62,000, which was $4,000 under our uh, estimate. So we will not be bringing that back to council. We can award the contract directly. Um, we do anticipate, we also have bids for doing some traffic monitoring. We're gonna do some before traffic monitoring, some tra after traffic monitoring. So hopefully we can start that monitoring in about two to three weeks. And we're gonna coordinate it with the contractor and get that finally built out there. Back to the picture. So uh, last night, this grand tree fell down in the lower Pacific Cove parking lot. It was a Monterey Cypress, it was one of the uh, taller and older trees in the city of Capitola. So I just thought I'd bring you a picture of it. Uh, we did have this assessment done in 2017. This is a tree that the Public Works Department has been monitoring and looking over uh, for decades now. Um, there used to be, when there was a mobile home there, mobile home park there, there was a mobile home uh, that one of our crew members' mother lived in right underneath the tree. Uh, we were very aware of the, the tree. Um, it had significant cabling in it, holding up the upper branches, trying to hold it together. Uh, in this 2017 report, it, uh, they found some root rot along the top of it. Um, they actually did some sonar investigations, found it hadn't gone very deep, but uh, it was listing at 21 degrees toward us in this picture and in 2017 and unfortunately it fell down last night. So if you advance it once, here's a picture of the tree down and that's Danielle you Harriet of my staff standing next to it. It's about an eight foot diameter tree as it came down. Uh, the parking lot's gonna remain closed for a while. Um, we're 
actually trying to evaluate the best way. I'm trying to find somebody who would like the wood, at least remove it at their cost, um, would probably be the best we can do. So we're, we're working on that. It'll certainly be closed through the weekend, and uh, hopefully we can get it removed next week. Thank you. Wow. That's pretty dramatic. So I have no more comments, and city staff has finished its comments. Let's move on to item seven, boards, commissions, and committee reports. City clerk. Yes, we have two items, um, the first of which is the swearing in of standby council members. Our city chooses to select one member, um, one standby member per member, and our two newest members have made their nominations. And if you would like to confirm your nomination, council member story. Yes, I would. I would like to nominate uh, Bruce Arthur as my standby council member. Uh, and just as a matter of introduction, if mm -hmm. I may just take a, uh, a minute, um, you know, Bruce is uh, a lifelong resident of Capitola. He served two terms on the council uh, before in 1998 and 2006. And he's also served us twice as mayor in the year 2000 and 2005. So I, I'm honored and pleased that he's willing to serve as my standby council member. Thank you. And um, council member Brooks, who have you nominated? I've nominated um, Michael Termini. No introduction needed. <laughs> <laughs> and this does require um, approval by the council, so I will ask for a, a vote to approve this nomination. Motion to approve nominations. Second. Are you going to take the roll on this one? You want? I don't. I okay. All do those in favor. I believe roll call would be necessary. I don't think so either. <laughs> all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. So passes. Thank you very much. And at this point, I will um, issue the oath of um, office to them. So if they would join me at the front, I will swear you in again. <laughs> Duly attired. You did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he always wears those. Like the, the, the of you want to face the camera? Yeah. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Uh, face the as camera. you would both say, turn around and face the camera, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> face right. I, Michael Termini. Smart. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution. And the Constitution. The Constitution of the State of California. Of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States, of the United States, and the Constitution, and the Constitution of the State of California, of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation, reservation, or purpose of evasion, or a purpose of evasion, and that I will, and that I will, well and faithfully discharge, well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, you're going to have to put off your trip, Mike, so, you know. Come back with a bonus one. Ah, there you go. All right. Uh, so we have one more item, appointments of uh, architectural and site committee and commission on the environment and area aging, area, okay. Yes, some more housekeeping. The first item is uh, a mayor's appointment. Uh, this is for returning members of the Arkansas Site Commission. These are uh, Daniel Gomez and Daniel Townsend, who are the um, architects at Fuse across the street. Um, and they have been serving as the alternate architects and they have um, applied for reappointment and that would be a, a simple appointment by the mayor. Okay, so be it. Uh, second item is the final appointment to the Commission on the Environment, um, and that is Councilmember Story. Would you care to introduce your nominee? 
Oh, oh, thank you. Yes, I would. I'm pleased to uh, uh, nominate Meredith Keith uh, as uh, my appointee to the Commission on the Environment. Um, she's actually a, a new business owner down in Capitola Village, um, and she's going to be opening up the Zero Shop, um, actually in the location where St. John's used to be. So um, everybody look out for that. Um, and um, I'm hoping if Meredith could come up and uh, introduce herself. Is she, is she here? I, well, I don't see her. Um, but um, that's um, who I would like to nominate to the Commission on the Environment. Thank Very you. good, and that will finish our roster. That is an individual um, nomination, so we do not need a council vote. Um, the final item is a replacement for the Area Agency on Aging um, Advisory Council. Uh, Stephanie Harlan had been our um, representative, and uh, Carolyn Sigstedt has been our alternate. Um, they were appointed last June to a two-year term. Um, Ms. Harlan has uh, resigned, so we have a <coughs> midterm reappointment for the representative. Um, Mayor Bertrand has um, expressed interest in taking that position, and Ms. Sigstedt has um, wishes to continue in her position as well um, and that is an item I would like a council vote on please is there a motion motion to appoint uh, Mayor Bertrand for the Commission on Aging Advisory Council second okay all those in favor aye aye okay so be it so let's move on to um, consent agenda is there a motion um, well, I, I'll move the consent agenda. Um, but I'll I second. But I did have a question about uh, on the check register. Okay. And then Whenever also comments right from the public now. afterwards. That's your question? You. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, it's on uh, agenda packet page 26. It's number 91412. It's Alvarez Technology Group. $7,540. Um, and my question, I just noticed, I mean, the notes say it's IT support for February, <coughs> and it was paid in um, January uh, of um, uh, the 4th, 2019. Um, do we always pay that far in advance um, for IT services? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, generally, we do for that for that service because we have someone on site um, for that, so we usually pay one month in advance. Um, but I believe th this uh, item will be part of the uh, mid-year budget review as well. Okay, this is so. this this is this the is contract that's being discussed for later. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Because it, it just it seems to me two months, and it should be one month. Uh, maybe there's a. It should be February paid in January, I believe. Well, I noticed that. Well, I just note, Larry, that the payment it was it's dated January the second. Okay. Uh, and it's for services in February. Yeah, that that so, seems a little. So sudden. I don't know I mean, if it was a scheduling or not, but yeah. I, I could take a look. Usually, we pay before <coughs> in advance of the month, but that that seems a little far ahead. Okay. Well, maybe the this will resolve itself later. Thank okay. you. Appreciate it. So, with those questions from City Council, are there any questions from the public? Bring it back to City Council. Is there a motion to approve the? We, we have a motion. We have a motion. Second. Oh, excuse me. Uh, did we get a second on that? Yes. I second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So moved. So let's move on to item number uh, nine: general government public hearings. Is there a presentation on this uh, contract with Central Fire Protection? Mm. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Nikki will be delivering this presentation for the Rec Department. Welcome, Nikki.
Mayor, Council Members, Nikki Bryant, Recreation Supervisor. Thank you very much for coming and hearing about the uh, Central Fire Lifeguard Training Contract. So um, starting in 2012, um, the city began contracting with Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz Fire Marine Safety for their lifeguard services. And then CSLSA, which is the California um, Life Saving Association, became interested that Cal uh, Capitola provide their junior guard program that be managed by a lifeguard agency. So the city of Capitola then began communicating with Santa Cruz Marine Safety Division to provide lifeguard training services for Capitola Junior Guard Services. And in 2016, they informed us that they were not able to provide those services anymore. So Capitola then shifted to a um, staff model providing for a beach captain and did the training services for junior guard for 2017 and 2018. Uh, at the conclusion of the 2018 uh, season, the beach guard captain resigned. And so for, um, to continue to try and find a, a model that worked well for us, we began to in communication with Central Fire uh, Protection Division in order to provide the lifeguard training for our junior guard instructors and coordinators. Um, so, it, as we have been working for this season, um, Central Fire Protection District will be conducting uh, swim tests in order to determine whether or not the junior guard applicants that we have are eligible for employment as they, um, as USLA determines that they need to be able to swim at least 500 yards in under 10 minutes. Um, for the physical endurance part of the position. Central will also be providing for the junior guard um, life-saving skills, the training for the lifeguard services, as well as providing for Title 22, which is a first aid CPR for the public servants. Um, this contract would be for $12,085, um, which covers Central's direct costs for the testing and training. Um, from the city, the contract, that the, that cost would be a redirection of the former Recreation Division staffing costs. Um, the, for the lifeguard tower services, Santa Cruz is is currently in contract with Santa Cruz Marine Safety for the summer of 2019. So that piece is still in play. Um, and we have been in communication with Central Fire in order to continue working towards um, having these training services and then lifeguard, ser lifeguard tower services um, in hopes for 2020. Um, I've been, I've had the privilege of working with um, Central Fire um, in preparation for this and to have their experience and their community connection as we work towards a model that we hope will be a continued um, solution for this is, has been a, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure working with Central Fire. They're really um, a great group to work with. And so for the final slide. Sorry. Um, the recommendation is to authorize the city manager to sign a one-year contract um, for the amount of 12085 with Central Fire Protection for the lifeguard testing and training services for this summer. Thank you. Yes. Any questions of our rec director? I have one question. Sure. Yeah. Um, so <coughs> does, by approving this contract, does it allow that the students participate in regionals? Yeah, so this is actually in order to make that happen. Um, as I said, CSLSA has a very strong interest in having um, junior guard programs be have the lifeguard saving skills and that their instructors are uh, equal, either meets or exceeds that training. Um, and so Central Fire brings that level of experience and that level of expertise in order to be able to have that level of training that we would need for our program. Great, thank you.
Any other questions? Two? No? Okay. Um, I had the pleasure of um, talking with Nikki, and I was very impressed with the effort that she's putting into this program. And um, just thank you for bringing it this far. I appreciate that. I do have a couple of questions. Um, on page 79, it talks about, and you referred to this, uh, testing so that uh, the 500 meter um, ocean swim time under 10 minutes can be uh, fulfilled. Um, that's our requirements. Um, from our experience in that, how easy is it to pass that? And uh, yeah, I'm just trying to get an idea. Is this something that we're going to be really working hard to find people to do this, or the people that apply have already sort of demonstrated that? I'm just trying to get an idea because the contract does mention extra fees if they need to. Uh, provide more service, and I would not like to go into that. Yeah. Um, so I might I might be interested to have some central fire maybe answer that question as well. But um, from my understanding, you know, we've in the past we've been able to staff with individuals that have been able to pass that swim test. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> the important part of that is that in order to be able to perform the skills necessary for open water life saving, an individual needs to be able to be at a, at a peak performance level and that swim test is an excellent measure to determine whether or not they would be able to manage themselves in an open water life saving emergency as well as manage someone who is in a critical condition while they're trying to remove them to safety. So I think that um, having that level, that test level, that's a, that's a pretty good standard. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that there are a lot of individuals that have grown up in the area, have grown up through the program, mm -hmm. um, understanding what, it, what, what is required to be able to be in the ocean and be safe and to be able to perform at that level. So I, I do think that it is a reasonable um, test standard. Okay, yeah. thanks. And I see someone coming forward. Oh, the chief, thank you. Honorable Mayor, members of the council, thank you. Steve Hall, Fire Chief for Central Fire. I just want to say before we bring the expert up to actually talk about the program, uh, what a cooperative effort this has been. Uh, for the last three years since I've joined the Central family, the first thing I asked was how come we're not providing this service to Capitola as a partnership. Um, I understood that Santa Cruz was, was doing the job at that time and, and they provided a great service for you and it just made sense as we move forward uh, in this relationship that, that Central take a, a larger role. Uh, the relationship that's been developed between Nikki and, and City of Capitola and Central Fire, Captain Harway is standing behind me, he's an actual expert in this from the, from the fire department side, um, has been phenomenal. And we truly believe that this relationship is going to build not only for the training and testing this year, but working toward that contract for next year where Central Fire will be providing your lifeguard service on the beach. So thank you for your consideration this evening. As always, uh, if there's anything I can do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out. And if I may, I'd ask uh, Captain Scott Hartway to come up. Any questions of the chief? Okay, I can attest, I remember three years ago when you said what exactly you just said that you wanted to do this job. So I'm glad you're here and we have a great partner with Nikki, so great. We're here, thank you. Yep. Hello everyone, <coughs> uh, my name is Scott Harway. I'm the co-chair of our current, uh, we have an AR team, which is an aquatic rescue response team at Central Fire. Uh, we're expanding to uh, an entire marine safety division. Um, and I've had the fortune, as Nikki said, uh, that we've had a great collaborative um, relationship over the past few months, kind of building this program from scratch, per se. Um, we've been working also uh, closely with the CS uh, LSA uh, to make sure that they're aware of every step that we're taking along the way. They support every decision that we've made. Um, they're happy with the progress that we've made. Um, and they are basically the overseeing agency that allows us to address your exact concerns, whether we're able to go to regionals or whether we're able to even compete on other beaches. Um, so uh, having their support for every step that we're making, um, to making sure that we're not only checking the box, but we're exceeding what their expectations are. Um, we've got a great uh, foundation for what we're building. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? For so everyone here knows, and everyone on this dais supports Junior Guards. It's an extremely important program for Capitola. Uh, not only for the kids, but also for the parents when they know their kids are going to be on the beach and they want to know that the training you provide is going to perhaps help save their lives. So um, your function here is very important. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. And I can say the same to Nikki. So I appreciate that collaborative event that you've you know brought forward today. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, any comments from the public? Bringing back to a city council, uh, is there a motion? I'll move staff recommendation. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Up. Uh, oh, sorry. I'd just like to make a comment on that yes. before we vote. Uh, I, I just want to add that, that this has been a program that's been around for a long time. Chief, thank you for your comments. Uh, but I think it, at this point, we also should note that uh, Capitola struggled with this because of basically the, the conflict with CSLA and junior guards and trying to deliver what uh, the residents and kids was best for Capitola. And I think we just should acknowledge that Santa Cruz did step in. Chief Frawley, I should say former Chief Frawley, uh, did step in and help us out when we were in desperate need. But the, the, the perfect fit for this all along is what we're heading towards today is with uh, uh, Central Fire, you know, Capitola Basics, Basics Fire Department providing this service. And I can say that I look forward to, you know, this, this first step in the process and getting to where we need to be, which is in 2020, you guys are doing everything for Capitola. So thank you for, uh, for, for broadening your program, taking this on. I know it's a lot of extra work and it's gonna challenge you, but uh, uh, great rewards for the citizens of Capitola, so thank you. Start of a good relationship. So with that, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so be it. Thank you. Thank you, Chief and all, for coming. So, moving on to mid year budget report. Jim, I guess you have the. Uh, okay. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council members. Um, so, we are at mid year budget update for fiscal year 18 19. So just a couple of highlights. Um, we are we we have uh, received nine percent more sales tax revenue this year than compared to the same time last year. But if you recall, last year the um, state had implemented a new software system, and they were behind in payments. So that isn't really an increase. It's really just the makeup that we were shorted last year. Mm -hmm. um, property tax continues to grow at five and a half percent. That's been kind of the growth rate for the last three or four years, and we anticipated that in the budget. And TOT is slowing a little bit, but still at 2.3% above last year. And then later on, we'll get into some additional TOT revenue coming from the passage of Measure J. And when you compare this year to the same time last year, both the revenues and expenditures have increased less than we anticipated. So for a revenue review, um, the number that jumps off this page to me is at the bottom on the percentage. We're only 41% of our revenue received at halfway through the year. But what I will say is um, sales tax, our biggest revenue source, comes in after the fact. And since December, we've received another 1.1 million in sales tax, which gets us a lot closer to 50%. And then uh, business licenses is also another good revenue source for us. Those don't start coming in until January. So we have about 190,000 of business license money that's come in. So we re really are pretty close to that 50% level. Um, so in, in a summary for the revenue, our budget amendment is going to request an increase to TOT revenue of 151500 broken out there by 95500 going to general fund, 30000 for local business groups, and 26000 for youth programs. On the other side of the ledger, we're going to uh, decrease our revenue budget by 139000 It's broken out there, the 70000 for parking citations, 48000 for planner cost recovery, and 21,000 for a building official. Um, the parking citations is really driven just by being short staffed through the summer, so we expect that to pick up. And we were a little bit ambitious on what we thought that parking citation revenue would be. Um, planner cost recovery is really just staff turnover. So it's just as we've been getting new staff up, we just have um, billed a little bit less, plus it was a little bit slower than we anticipated through the winter, but we think that'll pick up a little bit as well. And then the building official, that was really just a delay in starting that program with Scotts Valley. Our building official didn't come on board until the end of August, 1st of September, so we just are swapping some money over to cover the consultant costs during that time. So the, the net impact on the revenue side is only 12500 On expenditures, um, again, the number that jumps off to me is that 52%, but that's driven by, uh, we make the, if PERS breaks out the normal cost and the unfunded portion into two pieces, the normal cost we pay each payroll, and they give us the option to pay the um, unfunded portion either in a lump sum payment or 12 installment payments. We do the lump sum and we save 3.5%, which is about forty to $45,000. So 
So that's what's causing that to be a little above 50%. That'll even out as we get deeper into the year and th that catches up. Um, so our budget amendment on the expenditure side, we're gonna um, total decreases of 214,000, a little bit over, and increases of just under 180,000 for a net decrease of 34.3. That comes from 117,000 of reduction in personnel costs, 50,000 increase in special legal services, a net increase of 29,000, just a little over to contract services, and then I put that 3,700 for the Homeless Action Partnership on the uh, agenda packet, the attachment. We listed 8,700, that was a typo, so it's actually 3,700. Um, we also are requesting one staff change, and we'd like to fill the information specialist position in-house. We started contracting that out in January 15, and we just haven't been receiving the level of service that we feel we should. We'd like to bring it back in-house um, it would improve our, our support for our computer systems and help us get focused on planning for the future as technology is always changing. That would require um, adding an additional full-time equivalent or FTE to the city manager's department. The cost is about 12000 a year. And for the re if, this, if approved for the rest of this year, we can cover that additional cost this year with salary savings. Um, so I had mentioned Measure J earlier. Uh, Measure J passed, passed in November, increased our TOT from 10 to 12 percent, and um, it allocates 0.35 percent of the revenue, 54,000 a year, to youth and childhood programs. In our 18-19 budget, that included uh, 20, 27,516 for youth and childhood programs. We've paid about half of that. Not about. We've paid half of that so far. And when we did the resolution of intent to place Measure J on the ballot, we had discussed, council had discussed um, using the, if it passed, the Measure J money to pay the remainder of the um, community grant. So that's one of the discussion items for later on. Um, if, if we went that way, we would still have about 12,000 available for an additional 12,000 for youth and childhood programs that we could either do something with this year or we could roll it forward and include it with the 54,000 that we'll get that we anticipate getting next year from TOT. Um, it al Measure J also allocated 0.4% of TOT revenue to local business groups and again that um, resolution of intent placing it on the ballot said that that money would be divided between the um, Capitola Soquel Chamber of Commerce and the BIA. So one question that staff is looking for direction on is how to allocate that um, and how and it also was stated that that would be for marketing and community improvements so the question is how do we divide that up between those groups and then between marketing and community improvements and just by um, as a reminder our current budget allocates 30,000 to the chamber we've paid half so far and um, Measure J provides money to do that. So one of the things I'll have on another slide is using some of the new TOT money to pay the balance that we have budgeted for the chamber. And just, I don't want to fail to mention, the BIA has submitted a draft budget amendment to us, increasing their budget by 17,000. Um, I'm going to bring that back at a later date following direction from this evening. Uh, and I've communicated that back to Karin. And then they're also working on a new contract that's going to go to their board, so we'll package that up. And It'll probably be the second meeting in March that we'll come back with that. And also, uh, community grants in August, uh, well, our budget includes $275,000 for community grants. We awarded just under $241,000 back in August, designated $10,000 for the local community need account, which left um, $24,000. And at the um, August meeting, the direction was for staff to come back at this time with a plan or any recommendations for using any of that additional 24,000. So since our budget was adopted, um, homelessness issues have continued to increase. And one of the things that um, the county and other local cities have looked at is increasing funding for the improved coordinated entry program. If we were to participate in that, our share would be 4,944. 4, and then there's uh, the other local agencies are also looking at a comprehensive implementation strategy that evaluates, aligns, and improves 
um, countywide response to homelessness issues. Countywide, that cost is $360,000. Our share would be $5,150, and staff is recommending to use some of the remaining community grant money to fund the um, towards the homelessness issues. So this is a long slide with recommended actions, and really the the presentation was just kind of to, to get everybody thinking to facilitate a conversation. But I, um, so uh, the first is direct staff regarding measure J revenue for youth and childhood programs. Again, our staff recommendation is to use 13,000 of the 26, or almost 14,000 of the 26, to fund the remaining, the community grants for the remainder of the year, which leaves about $12,000 that we could either do something with tonight or again roll it to next year. Um, the second action item is to direct staff regarding Measure J revenue for the business groups. How, how should we split that between the groups and what direction do we wanna give to the BIA and the chamber as far as developing budgets and coming back and reporting what they've done with those funds. And then also the community grants, staff's recommendation to allocate 10,094 for regional homeless needs and then is there any council direction tonight re regarding the remaining 14,000 or has, is anyone aware of a need for the use of the 10,000 in the community need account? And then finally, once we get through those issues, approve the mid-year budget amendment and authorize staffing changes. So with that, I am open for any questions. Okay, we'll take questions from city council and then go to the public. Any council questions? Nothing, nothing, okay, Sam. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jim, I understand that there was some, what the previous council, I mean, this is concerning the community programs mm -hmm. um, and that discussion um, to hold back um, almost 40,000, 35,000, I'd say, um, and to solicit an RFP process um, um, and then to come back and reconsider um, those, um, uh, RFPs or requests from the community programs. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit about that history? Uh, did I get that right? Or, um, and Mr. Mayor, Council, Council Member Story. So the council's direction in August when we made the awards was simply to hold back this and leave it to the new council to consider at the mid-year. There wasn't any direction to for staff to issue an RFP. Uh, Councilwoman Peterson, you look like you have a point to add. I think Councilwoman Peterson was was actually tasked with taking, doing some work to evaluate our grant program and looking at our different grantees and maybe <coughs> come back at some point with some recommendations, but it wasn't anticipated necessarily that work would be completed by this, this point in time. Okay. Where, what is the status of that effort then? And um, is it continuing? Are we? Yeah, so I think if, if I'm not mistaken, what you're referring to is, um, when this came up last year, I said that I wanted to see an ongoing process that um, reevaluates the way that we're doing the entire community grant program, how we're, um, how we're choosing the nonprofits that will get funding, how we're choosing how much funding they will get. Um, and so it was kind of a two-part, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, it was kind of a two-part um, effort in holding off until now. The first part was that we understood that there would be new council members who had different priorities than what we had uh, last year. And so it gave an opportunity to consider that. Um, and also, yes, an ongoing process of considering how we're gonna do that. And that's something I'd like to uh, discuss later as part of the okay. community grants. No yeah. All right, that's good, thank you. Um, and uh, maybe a couple of other items, um, Jim, on um, in, in looking at our mid-year uh, status, I noticed the other area in which we had uh, reduced revenue was under fines and forfeitures. We're down only at 30% of those revenues. Is, is, that, is there a particular explanation for that? Because at that trend, it looks like we may be off like $78,000. That's the category where the parking citations fall? And, um, <laughs> Oh, those are one and the same. Looks like I thought parking enforcement was off 40%, and there was a separate line for fines and forfeitures. Which, um, I'm not sure what you're looking at. Well, I was, um, you know, on the 
I received a spreadsheet um, just today, earlier this morning. And it's uh, the income statement mm -hmm. uh, dated, it says through January 25th, 2019. Um, and it, uh, you know, it has a spreadsheet of the budgeted line items year to date. Um, and I was trying to get to that particular page. Page three of 27, um, it identifies fines and forfeiture totals. It's going to be in the summary, not the full. And, uh, yeah, and it shows it's, you know, oh. that's parking. Yeah, parking enforcement is down 40%. But you, are you, um, so is the answer to my question that those are one and the same? Uh, line yeah, could be small. off of this report, it could be in different categories. Okay. Well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll also uh, jump to the bottom line. Uh, on that particular income statement, I mean, if you go to the bottom line, um, it shows us currently with a year-to-date delta between uh, revenues and expenditures of a million two. Uh, but I assume from is your update and report that that's going to uh, basically uh, even out by the end of the fiscal year? Yes. With okay, so that's not anything that we yeah, should be concerned about? Yeah, and this was, no, I wouldn't be concerned with that because we've gone through this. This report was kind of a sample report that I sent out to the FAC when, as we're transitioning from the elected treasurer to appointed treasurer, I and trying to figure out how do we balance out what the mm -hmm. former elected treasurer used to do. So I haven't gone through this report and tied out any of these numbers. It was kind of a sample that was sent out. Uh, and when I responded to Mr. Wilk the other day, I just showed him this is what we were sending out. Okay. All right. So just we should ignore this, then. This is bad inform or dated information. I haven't gone through it to make sure that it's 100% accurate. Okay. The report that I used to put together the mid-year was separate from that one. Was separate. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have a few questions. Um, apparently, our individual standing parking meters fail quite rapidly, and uh, I don't know how that's affecting our revenue in terms of parking meters. Um, the other is uh, 50K in legal fees. Uh, what do we anticipate uh, going forward in that? And I don't know what those costs are from necessarily so I'd just like to know that mr. mayor so your legal fees are broken into two basic buckets one is the standing contract with the city attorney's firm for legal services and the other is special legal fees which generally is litigation and code enforcement mm -hmm. the first six months of this year so that's a number that's highly variable and highly variable in terms of the firm's amount of time they need to dedicate to it some years we have no litigation some years we have a lot mm -hmm. so we, we budget for it separately um, this year we had a number of cases that were active in the first part of the fiscal year both on the code enforcement side and litigation side so we're bumping it up by 50,000 um, because we've already expended sort of all the legal fees um, for this fiscal year okay thank you very much um, in your report Jim, you talk about expenditures being fairly stable, basically following a trend that you feel that will indicate a stable um, expenditure pattern. I was wondering if, um, you're not gonna be able to talk about that now, but for the fact, I was wondering if you could expand on that and project it out a year or two, just so that we get a better idea of how our expenditures are gonna go moving forward. Yeah, that, that really will be part of the um, budget prep for 1920. We'll That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll do, you know, the a budget that we adopt. We'll have the plan budget, but then we also look ten years out. Mm -hmm. So we have a a model in Excel that we use, and we're forecasting out the five first five years. We feel pretty comfortable, but then we go another five just to 
make sure there's no surprises out there. Okay. Yeah, I'm on the fact, obviously, you know that. And I was just looking through these, and I was trying to get a, a sense of how they will go and then add up as you go for it. And Christine, you are too. So those are my only questions. Any more questions from, no, any questions from the audience? Please come forward. Hi, Karen Delaney from the Volunteer Center and the Human Care Alliance about community programs. Um, yes, I have a couple questions and a, a couple comments um, about the community. It's been my honor to partner, to represent the Volunteer Center partnering with the City of Capitola since 1984. Another way to look at this recommendation, if you adopt this recommendation, it will be the largest cut to community programs in three decades. I know that that's not the intention and that's not how it's being expressed, but, um, you know, when we were here six months ago, the, the interesting thing to me about this is that, you know, there was this RFP for two year funding and I know that it's hard to evaluate the needs but I have to say that you got $45,000 worth of documented needs, current needs in Capitola residents that you didn't really evaluate after you asked for them that are still happening. I know I can speak to ours because we put in one of those unfunded uh, requests for the RFP um, to increase our senior program budget by $2,000. I checked this morning our fall prevention program uh, called Matter of Balance. We have 12 spots left for the next Capitola Mid-County training. We already have a waiting list of 65 and the training doesn't start till April. Our Helping Hands Senior Home Repair Program requests from Capitola residents in the last three years have quadrupled. There's a four month waiting list for that service as well. I'm sure that if you talk to any one of your trusted partners who responded to this RFP and still from our perspective feels like part of this process, we agree there should be a process improvement, but I think a lot of us were surprised that there was not gonna be a further evaluation like you're doing with the business community of what are the current needs. This is gonna be a cut to current services not because the city's in financial trouble, because it's not, not because you don't have documented needs from local residents, but because we're having big picture, wanting to make positive change in the process. And so I'm very much hoping that we can work in partnership and find a both and, a way to move forward with much needed improvements in the process for funding, because this was a two year RFP. So another concern that I'd like to hear someone address is if you do adopt this staff recommendation and ignore the needs that your partners expressed to you because you wanna have a better process last year, next year, what happens to the funding differential? Um, is there still, at the very least, there should be a placeholder that in next year's budget the base funding is is still 275 not the lower 245 and there should still along with some process to solicit current needs um my pal dave is going to talk about uh, the human care alliance specific requests for something that would really help we live in a time of great income inequality when we were here in august we talked about the recent change in the way the state, the more accurate way the state measures poverty. Um, for the first time, the state of California is using a measure of poverty that is adjusted for um, housing costs. Santa Cruz County has the second highest poverty rate in the state using that more accurate measure. Our poverty rate doubles, and in the report, the thing that is called out is 100% in the growth of Santa Cruz County poverty are people who have sources of income working poor families and seniors on fixed income. We have tremendous growth of people in Capitola who are living a poverty lifestyle and a tremendous backlog 
there is a need for every penny of this money. So I really respectfully request you, we're gonna continue to work in partnership on the larger process, but let's not ignore the very real needs that are pending right now. We can do both, we're smart enough. We have the partnership to do both. So I encourage you to um, consider the pr proposal from the Human Care Alliance. I, can can I encourage you to do one year funding for homeless don't reduce the base funding and maybe consider trying a way to look at some of those requests and spend every penny of this you can helping people in Capitola who are having real crises today. Thank okay, you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any other comments from, yes, please come forward. I'm our pal Dave. I'm David Bianchi. I'm director for Family Service Agency of the Central Coast and a member of the Human Care Alliance and both Karen and I are past presidents of the Alliance. Um, I'm here to speak specifically to our request and letter that we sent you um, about a specific request regarding uh, a wage equity a study for the nonprofit sector. We also sent you some relevant attachments which were a previous study uh, and some additional data. And um, in 2016, <coughs> The Human Care Alliance conducted a nonprofit wage study, uh, and what we found was actually worse than we expected. Uh, nonprofit employees were twice as likely to qualify and need public services than the general population. 40% of employees surveyed reported that they always hold a second job to make ends meet, and 33% more indicated that they sometimes hold a second job. 61% of employee respondents indicated that they required public assistance to survive in the 12 months prior to taking the survey. This included support from the food bank and rental assistance. As a result of what we learned, we launched a nonprofit wage equity campaign in 2017 and 2018 in order to increase awareness, assemble our stakeholders, create solutions and strategies uh, to address the wage equity issue. We need updated wage data and that's the next step. We asked Applied Survey Research, a local firm, to develop a proposal. We need a third party to gather this. The last study was an internal study. And um, we want to include more nonprofits in this study than just the members of the Alliance. The findings would lay the groundwork for solution-based discussions with all of our stakeholders. The City of Capitola this year is in a unique position. You have additional funding that's unspent this year. We have um, social service agencies are the last people to want to divert funding from current services for clients. But the reality for us is if we don't do this now, we're not likely to have the staff to provide future services. It's very difficult for us every time, and I can speak to my own position, when one of our staff members loses a rental, we stand a good chance of losing that person. In the past week, I had two staff members who moved in together to try to survive, lose their rental. There are two members out of a five-member program that provides a vital service to the community. I could lose both those people. So if we don't try to start somewhere and deal with the wage equity issue, we won't have any services down the road. That's a very real, problem facing us. So we hope you'll consider this because you're in a unique position and it's an opportunity for the City of Capitola to take the lead on this study. We've raised 11000 of the $21,000 cost of this, so we're asking specifically that you provide $10,000. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the audience? Please come forward. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Seth McGibbon, um, and I'm here on behalf of Community Bridges uh, as its Chief Admin Officer. Um, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak and also for the city's continued support of Community Bridges, Meals on Wheels, Lift Line, and Child Devel Development Division programs, along with Live Oak Community Resources. I'm here for two reasons. First, um, a request of the Measure J funds available for youth and childhood education programs, we would respect respectfully ask that you consider increased funding for Live Oak Community Resources in the amount of $5,000 for the remainder of this fiscal year and $10,000 for the following. We would primarily use this increased funding 
to support Live Oak after school tutoring program. The program currently serves a total of 39 children with eight residing in Capitol city limits. Utilizing the help of an AmeriCorps volunteer, we hope to expand our service within Capitola by holding sessions at New Brighton Middle School or Oval Cliff School. We believe this program is a great value, helping kinder through 12th grade students struggling with reading, writing, math, science, and language skills with one-on-one -on -one tutoring for free from a current group of 16 volunteers comprised of local college students, high school students, and qualified community members along with retired teachers. Second, I'm here to offer our support for the HCA's uh, request for $10,000 to administer a wage survey with the help of applied survey research across the county to ensure social services gaps are identified as a result of minimum wage implementation and to foster continuous serious discussion of solutions to this looming issue for nonprofit service providers. Uh, thank you again for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Um, any other comments? from the audience. Seeing none, bring it back to City Council for discussion. So I believe we have a, um, a format here that we could follow. There's many different issues that are being asked of us. And if we follow this format, I think we could get through this in an organized manner. And um, so the first item is to direct staff regarding Measure J revenue for use. So we have a recommendation to direct 13.7 to existing youth community grants, and then we do have discretion to fund 12,000. Uh, one question, that 12,000, is that uh, already budgeted for youth, or is this is because of the revenue differences? M Mr. Mayor, so, so that, that is the specific revenue from Measure J that's restricted to youth and early childhood education. Okay, and this, we have it sorted now, we could put it back later, okay. so. Um, I'm open for discussion on this item. I'll, I'll, I'll start off on this. Uh, the, uh, the recommendation to redirect uh, the community grants, it, it, you know, th there's a misconception here. I, I, I don't think that we should actually look like there's leftover money or extra money. I think the money that we have, uh, you know, just for, for clarification, uh, every, every group that applied last year uh, got uh, uh, what they had got the previous year, plus we gave a COLA to both groups. So nobody got, received a cut. And when it all came out, because of the anticipation of Measure J and the separation of how we were gonna start funding youth groups with TOT rather than the uh, regular community grants fund, we were making an effort to, to separate the, the funds. And uh, the main reason why there appears like there was extra money that was, was left over was is that one of the main uh, uh, groups, uh, Campus Kids Connections, from was a youth organization, didn't apply for $15,000. And when you take that with, I think what the proposal was is we were trying to um, create a fund last year, if you remember, with the, uh, the fund for um, unforeseen emergencies that would happen because uh, just like uh, as we're coming up right now, um, the issue that, that, uh, that we dealt with earlier this year was the, 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 the need of the homeless situation. And now all of a sudden there's an increase that we're seeing, we're gonna get to that later. Uh, but you know these things come up and, we're, and we don't have money allocated and then it puts us in a position of how to draw to so I think when I got together last year with uh, Councilmember Peterson we were trying to establish a fund of ten thousand dollars that would allow us should some unforeseen event come to be able to tap into that so um, you know, the money was pretty much all allocated and there isn't like leftover money per se no I, I appreciate that yeah. update and, and when dealing with if you want to deal with these one by one I'll just talk to the first staff and I mean first uh, recommendation the two dots the 13,000, um, what I'd like to see with this money is, is when it says here to, to direct it to existing youth groups, I think that we have something right in front of us that, 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 that we deal with and it is a bona fide youth group, it's our own youth group and that is the, um, the junior lifeguards and the, the, our recreation program and I think that you know we're, we're getting ready to do this investment into uh, um, with the um, central fire uh, it's, a, it's a similar cost, and I would like to see that 13000 directed into our uh, recreation program, which is specifically for youth recreation. Okay. And uh, with regards to the remaining $12,000, I don't have a specific plan on that, so I'll, uh, I just my only comment on that is I'd like to see us redirect the 13758 to our recreation program. Okay. So are we going to go... 
topic by topic. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, sure. I was just thinking we go topic by topic. Sure. So we stay organized on this. Yeah. Um, so, I'm extremely excited to be able to discuss the allocation of our city's dedicated children's fund. Mm -hmm. Not many cities have been successful in creating a dedicated children's revenue stream. And I believe we're actually making history, history today. We're only one of five cities that actually have a dedicated children's fund, so this is huge. Um, the shift validates our commitment to prioritizing early education and youth programs. So um, as I also understand what uh, what Councilman Bottrop was saying that this budget is a mid-year budget specifically for 1819 allocation. So what I would propose with the the TOT dedicated children's fund is to fund the remaining obligations to our youth oriented or um, youth oriented community grants from this year and from here on out. Um, this would leave the uh, in, this will leave in the dedicated children's fund that approximately that 12,000 that's shown up there and I propose that we allocate half of those dollars to the Boys and Girls Club and the Santa Cruz Children's Museum of Discovery. So by doing so, um, this will free up that 13,000 that you see there in the general fund that was already budgeted and dedicated to youth and I propose we reallocate those funds to the rec department as well. Um, to use towards a five-year strategic plan and to support staff in the um, rec department. Um, I just want to add that I would, I mean, when we get further down, I don't know if this is a good time, but lastly, I would propose that the 1920 budget include the previously committed 28,000 from the general fund that was originally allocated for our youth to assist the Parks and Rec Department even further in researching a partnership, as we heard earlier from our speaker, um, with the SoCal Union School District and nonprofits such as United Way and Live Oak Community Resource Center to create that um, after school program that they touched on, as well as to renovate the community rec room. So that's a lot. I've been thinking about this for a while, um, and I can go over that a little bit more if you need to. Is there any questions? So I, well, let's get to other comments first. Um, I can, I'd, I'd like to make a motion, if if we can do that. You may make a motion. Okay. Do you, you want me to read it all over again? Is that your, was that your motion? That was my motion, that was yeah. Your motion. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. well, there's a lot in there. I, I know, but and especially if we're going to take it piece by piece, I'd like Linda's to. Linda's going to probably want it to clarify. Yeah, yeah I, I have a copy it. too, Linda. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I have a video. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I, is and there a second a on this motion? Well, okay. as a point of order, can I can I have that motion restated then? So yeah, absolutely. Quick, I, I will. Is there a copy for everyone? Yeah. Do you want me to? Sure. I don't have a copy for everyone. Sorry, everyone. Give it to Linda. She okay, can read so it. That that'll I'll help us. Okay, the recommendation is to direct the $13,758 to existing youth community grants. Um, that's just reading what's up that's, there. That's yeah. at the top, so sorry. I'm therefore, getting the to proposal, there you go. Okay. We use, okay, new TOT dedicated children's funding to fund remaining obligations. Um, don't have an amount on it um, to youth oriented community grants for this year and from here on out um, 12,000 of remaining $12,000 allocate half so $6,000 to the Boys and Girls Club and $6,000 to the Santa Cruz Children's Museum of Discovery um, and a note that this will free up the 1375 in the general fund for this fiscal year um, which will then be allocated to the Recreation Department uh, to use toward creating a five-year strategic plan and support staff. Um, there's a portion in here about the next year's budget, but I don't know that that is actually, do we, do we want to include that in a motion for a mid-year? Um, I'm not sure of procedure on, on that yeah. since we're not in 
we, we will be talking about the uh, next year's budget goals, I think, at the next meeting. You could give us direction now, but we will have the opportunity to talk about that again. And I, I only note it because mm -hmm. community grants are a two-year budget cycle, so I just want to be clear in that since yeah. we'd be allocating all youth programs, or well, so since all youth programs that this should pass would be paid by the dedicated children's fund, this would free up essentially those dollars in our general fund. And I just want to be sure that I'm clear on how we should spend those general fund dollars. And that's why I mentioned that okay. in that last piece. Okay. So just So it's um I'm on I, I will say on, on my own for them, I'm a little unclear on the um funding the remaining obligations to the youth oriented community grants for this year with the TOT. Yeah, so as you can see up there, there is an obligation of $13,758. That is the remaining obligation that the city needs to pay for youth programs. And we have the option to pay out of our general fund, or we have the option to pay out of our dedicated children's okay. fund. So I'm saying, let's use the dedicated children's fund. Okay, and then the remaining Measure J goes for this divided year. in half between the uh, uh, Boys and Girls Club yes. and the other. Yes. Very good. Yes. And again, this is 1819 budget that we need to make a decision so on. So do we have a, a sense of what the remaining would be? So the remaining, if we were to pay that, our youth programs it's out of the, the dedicated. Yeah. So we would pay that out of the dedicated children's fund for 1819. What's left in 1819 is about $12,000. And I'm proposing to use that $12,000 to split it mm -hmm. to Boys and Girls Club and the Santa Cruz Children's Museum of Discovery. I'd like to add that when we passed that dedicated children's fund, we highlighted in the language on the ballot statement that we were going to use those dollars for early education. And the Santa Cruz Children's Museum of Discovery is one of the local nonprofits that works with, yeah, with early ed um, children. With the little ones, so that's where that came from, and then the youth programs comes from the Boys and Girls Club. Okay, so we have that. I'd like to hear other comments from city council members. Do we have a second? Let's I second it. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, well, I, yeah, I have some questions um, about the motion, um, and <coughs> because it's not in the staff report. One, when we say that it would be dedicated to, well, to the youth community programs. Which programs are we talking about mm -hmm. um, that it would be uh, dedicated to? I assume if, if it's the existing community grants Correct. that are focused on youth, um, I mean, just it's not, well, that now it, there it is, it's popped up on the screen. So those are the ones that are being recommended? I have seven if it matches, but here I haven't looked at this, <laughs> but we'll see. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, this was in the staff report we identified. Uh, the staff report cited um, $27,000, approximately $27,500 of youth oriented grants. Okay. This is the list of them and their 1819 award. This is how much we have put out today's paid to date on them. So this is that 13,758 um, that was referenced in the staff report as sort of the outstanding balance, if you will, on those grants. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, stand, I stand corrected. It's eight. There, there's eight up there. I just counted. So those are the eight that we selected as youth mm. last year. And I noticed the United Way Community Assessment Project is why, why is that identified as a youth program? I think we pulled it off of their application, actually. Larry, give me a nod if that's correct, because I think their applications identify who they serve, and so that's who they check on that. Uh, I, I think that's a fair question to ask, but. <clears throat> I've got that down as child abuse prevention. Sam. Oh, uh, so maybe it was identified as the wrong, okay. wrong United Way application. Oh, okay. United Way does apply for a number of different. Um, different things, so it, it, which is, a, that's a different project from the community assessment project. Right. Okay. I have it down as the child abuse prevention programs. Right, okay. Um, so, um, well, thank you for that. Um, that, you know, uh, gives me detail about with youth programs that we're talking about. Um, the other uh, um, proposal to direct um, some of the leftover funding um, to the recreational department, um, 
the recreation department does not just serve youth. So uh, there are adult programs that are providing through the recreational department. So we bifurcating um, those funds are directing them to only the youth components um, or to the entire recreational department. Uh, Councilman Story, so to answer your question, the um, additional notes that I had in my proposal would be that the dollars be used or utilized for a five-year strategic plan. Um, and how I see that is there's just multiple opportunities, especially how I see is that there's opportunities for the rec department to expand in, the, in their youth programs that are offered, and I would really like to see something in writing that kind of acknowledges that and, and shows that. And then, well, I won't get into the 1920 part of it, but ideally what I would, see, would like to see is um, the partnership for that after school, middle school program mm -hmm. with some of those dollars. So I, th I think one point of clarification, if, correct me if I'm wrong, is the new TOT money would go directly to the youth grants. Right. I think what Council Member Brooks was saying was when we free up the general fund money that was originally budget that budgeted there, rather than just drop it back into the general fund, allocate it to recreation. Correct. That, that was my suggestion, well, and I was right. and I was gearing it towards this new program, Santa, because it's specifically the lifeguard is specifically for youth, and that was my intent. May not be the same as Council Member Brooks, but the freeing up money is the money that I was talking about, not the right, TOT right. allocation. Mm -hmm. Well, just I, and just my sense about how we're shuffling money around, but not really providing any additional money to youth programs on what we had previously uh, provided. Um, um, you know, to me, that's just a little bit of sleight of hand uh, mm -hmm. to, um, you know, promote uh, the Measure J using those youth programs uh, and then shifting and supplanting it general fund monies that we're already directing to those programs. We, in effect, have not made any increase to the youth programs. Now, I know Measure J does not specifically state that, but it seems to me it would be in the spirit, and I know that the need is there, uh, that we just not take um, their existing grant money and supplant it now with this dedicated money um, and pat ourselves on the back and say we're supporting youth programs. My <coughs> preference would be that uh, they actually see <coughs> an increase in the amount of funding that's being provided, um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that maybe that's what the direction. I would if I, if I can just counter that, because it's a very good point, and, and Sam, it's well taken. What we did is, and, and, and the way it is, is that we're in a difficult part because we're transisting, okay, going from city funding, <laughs> and, and originally what we did is we tried to pull the amount of youth that was out, and then we tied it to the TOT, and the percentage of the TOT, based on the numbers that we bring in, will bring this program to $52,000 a year, which looks like uh, originally in its first year, it is only like about a $6,000 increase. So, uh, uh, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on these numbers, but what we were allocating to children was about. So this is, this is our projected total revenue. Yeah, the 54 is, 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 and which is gonna start taking it up. And then based on our TOT numbers, in the first year, youth programs would recognize only a 6% increase. So we, we're not taking any away, we're actually giving a small amount but then TOT is tied to a 5% increase every year. So what the intent of this program was is by, by buying into this with Measure J and our, our promise to the public was not only were we gonna increase it a little in the first year, but it would be one of the only programs that we support that is truly a growth program. Every year it would compound, who knows, and, 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 and we can be honest about this, if we are, were to build one more hotel, the number could double. So the potential for this growth is, is unlimited for youth. Okay, so I, so just be clear that we're not. Uh, there was never an intent to take money away, and I think and, and I, you, I don't know if the numbers are right. You can tell me what it is, but the first year was not a very big increase. But I, I thought it was about. I, I wrote down in my notes six thousand dollars, but if you tell me different. Okay. So so right now under Councilwoman Brooks's proposal, 
um, we would be increasing. So the total community grant allocation for youth is 27.5 in 1819, and then it would grow by an additional 12,000, which was split half between boys and girls and half between Museum of Discovery. So 12,000, that seems about a 50% increase by my math. Well, less, 45, maybe. May Mayor of Richmond, if okay. I defend uh, me. I'd like a comment from Ms. Brooks. I I'd like to actually respond because in since this is one actual agenda item I too was thinking the same thing about an increase and I'm going to propose that later on when we discuss the community grants so I'd like you know so I know we made this motion I don't know if you want me to move forward to give you that detail because um, I talk I would like to make that proposal okay. to, to talk about that so I don't know what yeah. the protocol would be but it, I definitely address that because I'm in full agreement with with that um, that vision right. well I, and thank you yeah. uh, councilwoman Brooks for uh, you know presenting that because I mean part of the difficulty I have is that we have many needs out there Absolutely. The, including the community programs and we have some other wonderful uh, service providers uh, even our own rec department um, but we don't I, I mean I'm, I don't have all the information in front of me about how to pick and choose between all the needs that are out there and so and, and I guess my preference would be to have a comprehensive presentation yeah. about all of these various needs um, including the pr community programs and then to make a comprehensive decision about how we are going to allocate this funding both the new dedicated funding um, and um, um, and and the balance of the community programs funding and, and there's also a SAP recommendation for the uh, homeless um, uh, action um, participation that we want to do. It's, um, I, I just, I'm uncomfortable doing it piecemeal. I would like to see this all in one presentation and so that we can make some, uh, I think, some, then some comprehensive judgments uh, about where to direct the available monies that we have um, and so that's what and yeah I mean I would certainly before I voted on this motion I'd want to hear what well what is the proposal for the community programs but I also have some difficulty there because I don't have the benefit of seeing what the what their requests were they're not in front of us um, and um, so um, and without that I think I would be hard-pressed to make these mid-year budget decisions uh, that significantly are going to shift uh, particularly the budgeted dollars you know there was 275,000 budgeted for community programs um, you know that shifting we have some new money coming in and things are just being shifted around so um, those are those are my comments and and why I'm a bit concerned about this process I support fully. I mean, all of you know, I mean, my heart is in community programs, and particularly youth programs as well. And we also have, I mean, just to mention, we have a request concerning a salary study, um, which is now in the mix. And I think that that should also be thrown in. Um, so I just, those are my comments. And do you have any? No. I mean, so are we, I don't know. Mayor, well, I haven't heard will, from Kristen. I would sure. like to hear uh, what she would have to say. And um, I know you've been working on this with Ed for quite a long time, and you have some background in this because you set the stage. Well, yeah, and most of what I, I have to say is actually just response to what I've heard based on what we did last year. Um, but I'll start by saying that I am in support of Councilwoman Brooks' proposal um, for the motion that she just made. That's why I seconded it. Um, the idea that we're supplanting the money from the general fund with the um, Measure J funds and that it seems like we're just moving things around, I can understand that concern. Um, however, I remember when we discussed this, that is exactly what we said we were doing, we were going to do, was we were going to wait until this exact event to consider that we could take the uh, children's funding programs out of the general fund and start funding it with the um, Measure J funds. So, in in my personal opinion, and what I remember of last year, this this is exactly what we had intended to do. And of course, I, I understand there's new council members, so it's 
um, you know, only three of us were, were a part of that particular action. Um, so one of the things I, I want to mention is I, I actually have every single application on my computer right here. And so the question about United Way being for youth or not, because their mission statement that they provided, ignite our community to give, advocate, and volunteer so that our youth succeed in school and life, our residents are healthy, and our families are financially independent. So youth, um, the, the success of youth based on the work of the United Way is directly in their mission statement. Um, but, but I do understand the concern that then when you move down further, it's about the um, assessment project and, and 211 helpline. So there's clearly a need for us to look at how we are, um, how we are requesting information about the programs that we are going to fund. Because I think there is some confusion there. Um, the salary study, I, I understand the need for that. I'm involved in, in different nonprofit organizations and in my um, discussion with Councilwoman Brooks, my understanding is that she's going to uh, address some of the changes in community fund um, allocations that doesn't uh, necessarily mean any one uh, study or any one program. And I, you know, I'm gonna stop it at that because I don't wanna speak beyond what I understand of it. Um, so in general, those are just my comments on, on what I've heard and where I'm at. So I have no problem supplanting the word, you know, that's where we're using. Um, for this year and moving forward, I would still like to have an evaluation, which, you know, I believe that's what we started uh, six months evaluation ago. Evaluation of our, our process? Yes. Yeah, that's what we're gonna get to and once we hit actual community okay. grants. We're just in the youth problem right now, right. but I understand they're kind of, they're tied together, so it's so hard to discuss one without the other. Yeah, I understand. Okay. So, and I think what you're proposing is adding two new programs, not necessarily in the supplanted funds from the TOT. These would be general fund funds. Okay. We'd be utilizing the dedicated, we'd be using, utilizing the dedicated children's funds um, by adding, the, with adding these two organizations. So the $12,000 is actually dedicated okay. children's funds. Okay. So it is not general fund dollars. Okay. Yeah, sure. okay. Um, I just took a stab at writing it yeah, down, yeah. just so everyone can see it on paper. I, let me know, Councilwoman Brooks, if I got it correct. I'm calling them Youth TOT Funds. I couldn't come up with a better name on, on the spot. Mm -hmm. I don't see the part in here about a strategic plan. Oh, there it is, okay. Well, and that's specific to the rec department. Mm -hmm. well, and like I said, as we move forward towards the community grants, okay. I, I'll talk a little bit more about that study. Because what I envision is study. the strategic plan will change how we view which, which programs we're going to fund. Yeah. Separate from what you see up here. Okay, got it. Separate okay. from what you see up here. Okay. Um, I, I just thought that it would be important to give the Parks and Rec Department direction on yeah. how to utilize the general fund dollars so those general fund dollars would open up and I would like, my proposal is that I'd like those general fund dollars to be used by the park and rec department and I, my direction would be that they utilize those dollars for their department to create their own strategic plan for the parks and rec department specifically as well as staffing needs. The community grant programs and what Sam was, uh, Councilman Story was talking about earlier about our process. I'll add some more comments to that after we finish here. Okay. Um, can, can I just ask a clarification? Yes, Sam. Um, what you just um, stated is that mm -hmm. um, on that third bullet point, um, mm -hmm. are you, are you, is that motion intending that 13,758 uh, of the general fund for this year? the balance of this year and thereafter no so it's no. just just one time in essence one-time one time money yeah. pretty much to do a yeah. strategic planning for you know their internal operations and um, and goals goals and objectives okay good question thank you can you go back to the other slide the, the, the one with all the okay 
We're just focused on the two. You can go back. You can go back. Is We're it helpful to do the first two bullets yeah. right now? Okay. Yeah. Is that helpful? I I was trying to. Well, I was trying to see if we if if, if, if we should if we're going to make a motion, I was going to maybe add to it and, and go go back to the other slide again. If 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 that seems to be sticking right there, I was considering whether we should go to the um, community grants part and add that into this one motion, or what do you think we should do that separately? I'm I'm just in discussion. It seems like if there was any concerns about moving forward with this motion that are based on the community grants, then it would make sense for us to kind of jump into that now um, to consider it. But that's just my personal opinion on that. Yeah. So uh, jump into it and hold I, on I, this motion? Or? Well, I mean, before I make a motion, I mean, I, I, I would just, as I look at this, mm -hmm. okay, I mean, I, I'm, okay with, I'm okay with the recommendation to allocate the $10,000 to the homeless needs mm -hmm. and then it says here there's council discretion remaining 14,000. Is that 24,000 or is that? 24. So that's 20, so council discretion remaining 14 and 10 in local community need account. So I, I was gonna just have a conversation, but I, think I thought maybe we'd have a conversation first before making a motion because I don't really have a, I, 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 I just gonna throw out, I, oh, that's what, I, I was gonna throw one thing. I, I am in favor of the 10,000 and I believe, were, were the other two numbers did they comprise that 10,000? Is that how you came up with the 10,000? Yes. Okay, yes. so there's not another 4,000, 5,000. No, those it's two 10. numbers made up the So 10. basically reading this, there is $24,000 that we could still deal with. Is the $10,000 emergency fund part of that, or is that, that we don't need to pull that out of that. That, that 10,000 is already set aside? From last year, I mean, from earlier this year. That ever? The 10,000 that's listed there is, is the critical need fund. Yeah, the local community need account. Okay, so yep. that so 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 then the two points that I would support here are is that there's the ten thousand ninety four for the homeless needs, and the ten thousand into that emergency, which means that we would have fourteen thousand to discuss to disperse. Is that accurate? I, th I think it's council discretion. Certainly, I mean whether you identified the ten thousand dollars for regional homeless needs or or from the community grant or from the local community need account, it's it's. Uh, I'll just make it clear. It would be my position to allocate ten thousand to the to the emergency fund, the ten thousand ninety four, and I don't have a feeling uh, about the ten thousand. And one thing I will make a, a statement on is, is I always like to tread very lightly when we get into class and comp studies, and and uh, I, I don't know that I would be supportive of funding a class and comp study for in, any organization. I, I would rather see our money directed towards other needs than trying to establish wage and salary surveys because the one thing that goes in hand with class and comp surveys are once you once you perform them then you are there's that need to meet that obligation that you've identified so I would I would rather shy away from any money going towards any kind of wage study and that, those are my comments yeah. okay Yvette and then Sam Thank you. Um, so may I amend my motion yes to what? add language that's Talk that so that we can address the community grants discussion so that I can include. I was going to make a friendly amendment, but I wanted to hear from the rest sure. of the council before we okay. did that. Okay, well, so if I may um, yeah. add just more more information to that, those notes Jamie <laughs> had up there a second ago. Go? So this is in regards to the community grants as listed there to give staff recommendation or to give staff direction so I would add I would motion that we approve the recommendations to give to allocate the ten thousand nine ninety four dollars for the regional homeless needs and then with the additional fourteen thousand dollars remaining and ten thousand dollars in the local community need account I would propose that seven thousand dollars goes towards a comprehensive study on how we how we spend our community grants or how our community grants are allocated. So we would go out and review that and have some or have someone come in. It's a wage study, I think. Um, no, not a wage study. This would look at how we're spending the total two hundred and forty thousand dollars in community grants we give out every two years. So you're saying that would be internal money allocated to them. So those dollars, the fourteen thousand dollars that we have here in eighteen nineteen, council or staff is asking us, 
how we would like to spend those one-time dollars. And my proposal will be to use $7,000 towards a comprehensive study on how community grants are allocated to our nonprofit. Is that, did you get Pretty much, notes? You, we yeah. would hire somebody to go over all the applications and, and have them be the one that scrutinizes what. So the external, right, okay. Right. Contract and it out, okay. Right. And then a 2% one time adjustment towards current community grant recipients, including youth, progr um, including youth programs. So what Councilman Story was talking about earlier, this would address that that they would get this one-time 2% increase to, to their funding, their funds, and then leave the remaining amount, so 14,000, 10,000, 24,000, whatever's left over after we spent the 7,000 and the 2%, leave the remaining amount in the general fund to be used towards our streets, road improvements, and other priorities previously set by council, and anything that may come out of our comprehensive study. Is the 2% uh, on the roughly 200 and some Correct. thousand? 240. That is 240. Okay. Mm -hmm. About five and, grand. And, mm -hmm. and I'll just add that I, I knew we were going to be here if, you know, as new council members that we were going to be asked to do, to come up with a solution or come up with ideas. And I feel we're at this this kind of fork in the road where, as council member Story said, we need to be able to analyze how these dollars are allocated and really be thoughtful in the process. And I feel that this comprehensive study is, a, is an opportunity to do so and also n allow that our current, um, our current nonprofits get a little something in the meantime so that they're not waiting. I will add, if anyone was questioning, I know that next year there's an additional 2% that, is, um, that our, our, our um, nonprofits are supposed to get, and I'm still fine with that. That has nothing to do with this. Is this is on top year. of that. This is on top of that, correct. And this is just the $24,000. That's all we're, we're talking about today. I have a quick comment on the uh, comprehensive study, because I just want to clarify. Um, Mayor Bertrand, when you were asking about it, you said that, that the study would basically just hire someone to choose who gets the money, but my understanding of it is that it would be hiring someone to evaluate how we are already choosing who gets the money. Um, you know, the county went through their program to, to do that. Um, our finance director provided me with some information from six other cities with how they do their community grant program. Sorry, Sam, I don't mean to have my back to you. I'm just seem to be this okay. way. Um, I can hear you. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to, to clarify if that was um, what Councilwoman Brooks was suggesting, uh, that we're doing a comprehensive study of how we do it and not just handing it over to someone to do it for us. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't want someone to choose for us, believe no, me. No, absolutely. So yeah, no, I was I wondering, agree. my question to you was, are we allocating 7K of staff time or are we allocating 7K to an outside contractor? And it's an outside contract. That's all I want to know, basically. So, um, may I confirm that the second is comfortable with so this amendment? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I would like to make a quick comment that m when we met with some of the um, HCA members who wanted this this study, I can understand your concern, Ed. Um, I understand the importance of the study, but I think that. What we were told was that some of the HCA members were able to um, um, provide funding towards that effort and some weren't. And so m the way I see this is the 2% one-time adjustment I hope would provide at least some funding that they could leverage um, if they choose to use it for that purpose. Okay. But not specifically. No strings um, on the 2%. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. That's good thinking. I like that. And I, and I think that if we um, um, are going to create, w before we go out and contract somebody, that we should all give the input as to what we're looking for this person to do. It. It's not my intent as, as for someone to pick who we, who we give the money to, but more or less we establish criteria of what we're looking for, something simple like capital-based needs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then someone would come back and say, based on your criteria, 
these are the groups that we see as most, you know, fit your needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and and I think we would establish that criteria. So, uh, Councilwoman Brooks, I did my best to take it down just to make sure everyone's I looking know, at I'm, the same I'm, thing and understanding it. it if you could just take a moment to make sure that I got it right here, just so that everyone's looking at the same thing and has the same understanding of what, what we're talking about this evening. With the first line, I just wanna make sure that fund remaining youth grants with the 13,000 and from here on out, I just wanna be clear that youth programs are funded from the dedicated children's fund from 18, 19 on. So we're going to be deciding at some point maybe based on this study what programs to put in there and what programs to take out so that's and, yeah. still to be decided okay. by 2021 yeah. you know the 19 20 dollars and you know, when much it is, uh, yeah and you know those that's kind of already been set by previous council members so ideally by 2021 is really where we'll be able to use that mm -hmm. study and have meaningful conversation around how we allocate to nonprofits in the future. Um, do uh, talk to a few other people. May I ask I the city attorney? Um, can we? Can they direct how a fut future funds are spent? No, certainly, council has the right to express its policy directives. They can't bind future decision makers to anything, but they can give the intention of the currently composed council. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just want to make a, a question of staff. Is 7K pretty good to do a study? That, that's what I'm wondering. Is this enough? It's, it's going to be part of a whole, but I, I, I'm just, I don't know where we're at in terms of that. I have not done a ton of research into what, what this would cost, but I think we can reach out to some folks. I know the folks who prepared and work with the county um, and check in and see whether that's a ballpark figure. Um, I think... I think we could make something work with that. Okay, Ed? I just had a question, if, if the $10,000 emergency fund got, do, do we have that, is that, do we, I can't remember if we established it last year or if we were gonna do it this year or if that fund is established and, and funded. That's the local, uh, what was it? Community was on, needs. Yes, thank you, local yeah. community need grant. That, that was what the one that we were calling our like emergency. Right, and grant. that is included and established? Yes. Okay. Well, That's what it, it would be spent. But it would be spent under this. It doesn't exist. All, all but about two thousand would be spent. Mm -hmm. Well, no, the other mm -hmm. two thousand would go for street. So yeah, it would. If, the other ten would go. If I may, if I did the math correctly, there's twenty-four thousand dollars essentially on the table that we're talking about tonight. Seven, twenty-four thousand minus seven thousand, and two percent adds up to about five thousand. So that leaves a little over ten thousand dollars to go back to the general right. fund. Did the homeless money come out of this? Is that what we did? We we basically well, the homeless we, money's there, but it's the last bullet that says leave remainder in general fund for streets, roads, and other. Mm -hmm. That well, is I'm with telling her. me you to go back pull to that, that previous slide. I saw twenty four thousand. Was there not twenty four thousand? No, there is. But what I'm saying is the last bullet there says leave the remainder in the general fund to fund streets. So is it? Am I leaving two thousand to go towards streets or? 12,000 to go towards streets, that's what I'm Oh, okay, well then that's what I was clarifying, because I, I would still be my hope to have the $10,000, and if there's only 2,000 for streets, so be it. But it was, I, I thought that what we were trying to establish last year, last year was this emergency fund that would always be there if it was needed. Oops. That would be, and if I were to make a friendly amendment, that would be my amendment to, to put that back. Which is essentially, excuse me, it, Mayor, sorry. Um, which is essentially still general fund what dollars. What Cor if, so, uh, so um, Madam it, Clerk, oh, hold on. Uh, can you please finish your comments? Yeah, so I, I absolutely see what you're saying, Council Member um, Bertrand, that you would like to see the $10,000 that's titled local community need still be titled that and remain in the general fund as a local titled local community need dollars those are still general fund dollars as i understand them is that correct yes so. but we can we can designate it for critical need which is where i'm I just have trying to make right sure now. we have stat we have established a fund and and, and, and I, i'm not i'm getting to look like 
Because I don't think we did that. We never, we did not establish a fund. I, I think there's a little bit of a language, um, technical language differences. What, what we did was we did not actually establish a fund. We established an account. So it's an account within the general fund. Um, mm. That's just simply the way structurally I think we set it up based on the previous council's, the previous direction. We could set it up as a fund, in which case it would carry over with a fund balance year to year. Well, At this stage right now, it's just an account. So. I guess my intent was to fund it, and that's where we're getting stuck here. Because I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that we were just didn't create a pocket, but we put something in. It's a folder. You're telling me there's a folder, but there's nothing in that folder other than it's tied to the general fund. Yeah, I, I mean, was I, trying to use the residual funds here rather than just leave it vague in, in roads and streets. I just wanted to say no, this is here. So when that need comes up, this fund is available. And I thought that came out of our conversation from last year. It did. So I'm, so I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. It was just uh, that was our intent. I just have a question, uh, staff, um, just to help here. So last year when we decided on the ten thousand, we knew where it came from. If this it fund came out of set, community programs, that's right. So if this fund setting up being set up, what would feed it? Community programs, still. I, I, that's what I want to you know. No, Sam is 100 percent correct. This was money in the community program. It was, it was right, and, and it was to be earmarked because we when we when we pulled it out and we separated primarily because of the 15,638 withdrawal of campus kids. Yeah, that 10,000 dollars became available, and it was a and it was a youth fund that we weren't going to support, and then the youth funding was going to be increased. So the intent was, should there be an unforeseen emergency, we would have money in a fund to immediately draw from. Okay. And if, well, I may, if I may add to that, that it's still, the, the point of it was still to use it to grant community programs that may need to um, address emergency needs that we can't do. Things like, um, oh gosh, what was it? Food um, distribution, or if there's a flood and we need cleanup. So the idea behind that wasn't just that the city holds on to 10K for whatever we want. It was, it's a, it's a, community need program because if something happens we will have this money waiting for us to give to whatever community program um, is able to meet the, those emergency needs okay that's, that's unforeseen that's unforeseen well, yep well, th that's my understanding okay but that was something we agreed on six uh -huh. months ago basically yeah. so but we why created the pocket we never we didn't actually fund it. Not right funded. so my point is if we're going to keep that fund how are we going to keep feeding into it that's my question so if it's it drawn on, then it'll have to be addressed when it's drawn on. But it's okay. not, we, we don't regularly funds. fund it. Okay, but that, that's my but question, basically. Okay. It doesn't become one of our ongoing, right. like that every two years so we're we going to look at that anymore. We need, okay, yeah. kind of, okay. Okay. Um, hmm. Any more comments on this? Uh, Sam. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I did have a question. I'm just trying to clarify what actual numbers we're relying on. Um, as I understand it, we had budgeted $275,000 for community grants. Um, in August of 2018, $240,914 was um, allocated, um, leaving a differential of $34,086. $10,000 of that was shifted into this special needs program, leaving a balance of $24,086. Um, so just one for clarification, the homeless needs, the 10,094, is that coming out of the community, uh, local community needs account? It is. So which leaves a balance of 24,086. And, um, oh, and I, I, I'm sorry, no, it's not coming out of that. It's coming out of the, the, this, this, it's coming out of this fund. Isn't it, is it coming out of the residual 24? Isn't that what we just decided? Well, actually, the residual is 34 originally. And well, so. I know, but I, I was agreeing with you on the 10,000 into the emergency fund, so I'm down to 24. And then the homeless right. needs come from that 24. Correct. Is that, that's what he's asking right. for clarification which is on. Down, okay, which that's is down, the clarification. Down to 14. I, right. Yeah. My understanding, that I thought the 10,000 was coming out of that homeless, uh, the needs, the community needs portion. Um, um, but so. Well, that clarifies so that um, we're holding on to the 10,000. Um, so the 14,086 would be, uh, is the remainder available. 7,000 of that is going to, for this uh, 
community grant study, um, which leaves uh, another 17,000? No, s seven. Um, oh, 14. thank you, thank you, right, and right. And the 2% yes. raised gobbles up five, which five. leaves us with about two. two. Yeah. Okay. Great, now that I've got the numbers clarified, may I make some, my comments about this proposal? Sure. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I, I'm extremely, you know, um, I think concerned about it because number one, um, we are uh, making the biggest cut to community programs that, that Capitola has ever done uh, and that now it's going to be permanently baked into our budget. We're going from 275 to 240. Um, and, if, and, and, and as we've heard and as we all know, there is great need among the nonprofits. We've heard, um, you know, their uh, statements are um, about the uh, salary equity uh, uh, among those organizations, um, and um, but even in the face of those needs, we are withdrawing and we're pulling back uh, and not using the funding to address immediate current needs now uh, that those organizations have and that their service providers and our community members need uh, in order to access those services. Um, so that's one I have a concern about that. Um, and the proposal to spend $7,000 uh, in the face of the other actual um, service needs that there are and salary needs that we are, we're just going to do a study, um, which, and I'll, uh, my interpretation is that's just going to open up a huge can of worms. It doesn't make it easier because you hire somebody to come in from the outside and study and make a recommendation about are we going to fund Meals on Wheels or are we going to fund um, um, any of the other um, uh, nonprofit programs? Uh, are we cutting some? Are we, you know, I, I think, you know, zero based budgeting, if that's what you want, uh, how you're going to direct this, is going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be a horrendous process. I've seen it attempted uh, in other jurisdictions. Uh, over the many years, okay, and they they go through a lot of of uh, motions, but then they end up with the same funding for uh, allocations that they had before, because all of these organizations they have needs, they have their established budgets, and they operate on shoestrings. And if you pull monies from any one of them, that could potentially be the death knell for them, because they operate so tightly. So I just wanted everyone to be aware of what you're getting into and that you're going to spend $7,000 to do and do that extremely. And I would say it's, it won't be a workable process because we would be, and it's ultimately going to be up to us. If we're going to do it, let's just do it. Let's <coughs> save the $7,000 and then we could, um, you know, try to work through what is our approach what are our priorities and how do we want to fund them and, and ask for uh, proposals on how they can meet that. Uh, and then we can, but it seems that, and I'll just tell you over the years, there's many, many efforts to do that and it has always failed. The only difference about this one is we're spending $7,000 to get there. Um, so, I mean, that's just uh, the 2% one time you know, I'm sure that they, they would love to get what they can, but if you make it one-time money, it's going to go for, um, um, you know, fixed expenses because if it's one time, they're not assured to getting it again in the following year. My concern and priority are about the wages that are at these nonprofits. I think that's where we should be directing our attention in trying to see if we can do what we could to enhance the you know, the livable wages among the staff, the service providers, people that work really hard for uh, some of the most deserving residents in our community. Um, and so, and I certainly, you know, wouldn't, whatever monies we have left over, I mean, we're sh in essence shifting community programs money now to, um, you know, streets and roads, which has its own priorities, but I think that we should deal with that separately. 
Um, and I know, and one final thing about why I'm not going to support this motion is because, it, again, yes, and there was discussion on concerning Measure A and the youth programs of supplanting the additional money, and that's what we're doing, and I don't agree with that approach. So I think for all those reasons, um, I'm not going to support this motion. Um, and I would hope you would, at least on that part, about spending money for a consultant to study how we approach this, that you give that some really serious thought before you dive into that. Thank you. Thank you. Sam, thanks for those comments, but I, I, I think I need to clarify something and, and get us back on board because I, I don't want the, the, the message that comes out of this meeting tonight that we are for the first time lowering the amount that we give to community grants because that's not true. Our community grant program has been $275,000. And the, way, the reason that we that the, what made ch the challenge this year was the introduction of, of uh, Measure J. And I think that we really need to realize how vital and important that was to this city and to the youth. Um, not only did Measure J bring $200,000 worth of income into the city coffers, but it's going to fund, as, as uh, Yvette mentioned, this is a program where we are now one of very few cities that have dedicated money. And, and we have opened that door so that the potential of that fund to grow, it, like I said, it's a, in my mind, it was a moderate increase this first year of $6,000. City manager says it's 12, I'm not going to argue, but it's a fund that I know is going to continue to exponentially grow. So I feel really good about what we did there. And, and, and the important thing you need to take out of that is there were no cuts made to any of the regular other community grant programs. And, I, and I want, that's the one I want to defend. Well, you take the $275,000, we had a withdrawal of funds from campus kids and from families in transitions, which were both youth programs. Those funds were $15,638, and the other one was $2,521 for a rough total of $18,000, which was not given into youth this year. And I didn't have a problem withdrawing that money from youth because I knew that I would be supplanting that with other money from TOT as we move forward in perpetuity. So if you take the 275 and subtract the 18, that means that you still have $257,000 left in our Capitola program. And we budgeted last year $240,000, which means that that we, what we really didn't spend was $17,000. That's the net to the other community grants, okay? And what we did is we just took today, I, we held that back. I, we wanted to create, because what we did when we went, we took all what, what people had asked for and what we had given them the previous year, and we gave them a 2% raise on that and a 2% next year. Nobody was cut. Nobody, this is the general list. It's, it's, it's sloppy, but this is, what we gave, and we, and we allocated all that money with increases that roughly about $4,500 for each 2% that we gave. So the $10,000 that we just, uh, that we're getting ready to approve today for that emergency fund would take your 257 down to 247. And then what the number we did was 240, and there's $7,000, which is, as far as I'm concerned, legal, legitimately, is still owing to the mass community grants program. We shorted them $7,000. Uh, Council Member Brooks just authorized or recommended another 2%, which will be about, I'm gonna call it $5,000 just to, to, to rough it off. So that means that we have a, a delta there of $2,000, which legitimately is that we have shorted the community grants program which basically says that if we're going to approve the $7,000 for to, uh, to figure out how we allocate this money, 5,000 of that is coming from the general fund and only 2,000 is coming from the community grants program. Uh, and I remember that when we did this, you know, bless council member uh, Peterson's heart for trying to take this on, but she tried to take all these applications and Sam, you know, we've struggled with this since I was on the council with you trying to figure out who deserves the money, you know, who really needs the money more. And, and she tried to go through that, and, it, and it's pretty painful, not, you know, exhausting, not painful, but exhausting to figure out, you know, what are the needs and how they do this. So when she suggested that we would hire somebody who would scrutinize this, who maybe would have some expertise, somebody from the county, I think it's a great idea. And, and if I'm using $2,000 of, of community, because that's what it is, it's $2,000 of their money, 5,000 is coming out of our general fund, 
if it costs more, I would even pay that because it, it, it takes her off the hook, it takes somebody else off the hook, and it says, here, here's the needs of your town, here's what we determine it matters, and let's pay the money, okay? It's, the intent is never to whittle that fund down, okay? The, the complicated part for us was we had to go through the process of pulling out youth from regular, and, and part of our intent was, and this is what we, when, when Council Member Peterson and I gave the, the raises was, to try to keep it at that number. And like I said, it, it, it's, it's clearly $2,000 is what, is what the delta was between those. And there was no intent to ever cut uh, money that we allocate towards our, our regular community grants program. So I will be supporting this, this motion. If, may I just make one comment about, you know, spending $7,000 for a consultant does not take us off the hook. I mean, it, it's, it's ultimately all going to fall on our shoulders about whatever recommendations are, are made and we have to make those tough decisions sure. so I don't I, yeah I just don't want that perception that if we just spend money and hire somebody that our jobs are going to be easier and they're going to have a magic solution no. and my prediction is that that's not going to happen um, and it's going to be an extremely you know difficult uh, and I would ultimately say um, an unsuccessful endeavor. Okay, so well, the I, I'm thinking the glass is half full, and and uh, and I'm willing to take a chance on it. And, and like I said, it's it's it, I'm not taking the money from uh, somebody else's hand. I'm actually this money indirectly is going to be from the general fund, is what what we're, where it's coming from. And I know how exhausting it was to try to go through this. And ultimately, I think my only concern when I'm up here giving out because you're right, Sam. We'll have to bring those back. But but to me, it's going to be like we're getting a staff report. Here's a staff report, which is what we get from our city manager, and I'm gonna look at this and say, you know, based on this criteria, I think that these are the, are the agencies who warrant an increase or a decrease, and, you know, that's where I'm at. I'll let someone else speak. You that? Um, and, and my vision of the comprehensive study would, is an analysis of the entire community's needs, and using measurable and systematic approaches, really looking at Capitola as a whole and really what the needs of our residents are and how we should support those residents. And by spending those dollars, that's why I think it's important to have um, an outside agency work collaboratively with us. This isn't us handing something over and saying, do the work. This is a collaborative effort and, and that's, that's just my vision versus, you know, letting them take the bull by its horn. So, um, I just also want to clarify um, in the discussion about what this um, this comprehensive study would do. The fact that I had already looked at all these, I, I want to say that it's right. The what Councilmember Bratorf and Councilmember uh, Brooks said is is absolutely correct. That the intent was to see. What are the programs that really need more money? And can we give them more money? What are the programs that aren't quite serving the community the way we expected them to with the money we're giving them? And so I started just with from the applications, everyone told us what percentage of Cal, uh, Capitola they serve, Capitola residents. Um, and then I looked at how much money we're giving them. And when you put these on a bar graph kind of line chart, I found that some of the programs getting the most money from us were serving the very least amount of Capitola residents. And so that in and of itself was a little concerning. However, and this is where I think a consultant is really important, that alone cannot determine how the importance of any, anyone's services. Um, so then it comes down to, okay, well, uh, what if they're 100% giving board and are they, um, uh, is their budget much larger than others? And then are we gonna weight those? Is it weighted based on which one of those is important? So these are a lot of questions that ultimately I think we can call it a consultant, we can call it a comprehensive study. The way I see it is it's essentially um, someone, it's a mediator, someone who's gonna do mediation of our attempts to determine how we're doing this and how we want to do this in the future. Okay, at some point I think this discussion is going to keep on going and I think um, I'd like to end it at this point. Uh, one comment from you, please. No comment, actually just clarification on the motion because I've actually heard council people say two different things. Okay. And I want right. to get clarification. 
Is this a two-time, or 2% 2 one-time adjustment, or 2% ongoing? Would it be? Well, I think it's built in. Once you give 2%, it's built into that base. Well, not if well, it's one time. Yeah. I mean, it says yeah, so, one time. So I've heard two that's different things, said. and that's what I'm trying to get clarification. Sure, one so it's, it's the 2% it's the one time for the, these particular dollars, because we're only talking about 1819, and I want to always bring it back that we're only talking about 1819, and the proposal of the $14,000 and the 10000 the fourteen thousand dollars essentially so it's the one time what to do with these dollars is to give the current community grant recipients a two percent one-time adjustment from what i understand and what the other council members have talked about is next year 1920 there's already an, an additional two percent embedded in and of course they would still receive that okay so i think i'm hearing i'm hearing you say ongoing and i think I, if it's not ongoing, I would make a friendly amendment that it is ongoing. I think it's too confusing to claw money back. If we're going to give 2%, don't take it away next year. That, To Sam's point, the one thing these agencies can't do is have money less. And for us to come and tell them we're giving them less. Right. So and when, when you talk about giving it the 2%. I, I would just make a friendly year. amendment or have you amend it to say it's a 2% ongoing because it would be built in. And then when they receive the 2019 allocation, it would go on top of that. Or 2% or for the two-year grant cycle. Is that no, yeah, no, it's, it's an extra 2%. Just throwing in an extra 2% yeah. this year. It's so it would essentially be 4% right. in, in well, I just want to make sure, because I think we're using slightly different terminology, but I think everybody's describing it the same way. So it, I think the 2% ongoing adjustment, and then there'd be another 2% at the next fiscal year. Correct. And, yeah. and that's for 18, 19, and 19, 20 yeah. only that we're talking about for this. And so not ongoing from 2021 on. Mm -hmm. Well, right. And I mean, the only reason I'm saying that is because I would want the possibility to give an increase if possible. If we see an increase in our dedicated children's fund or that this comprehensive cut study comes out and says you can do X, Y, and Z, I want there to be opportunity to have that conversation. Right. I don't want to lock you it You just in. have a two-year right. grant cycle, so the whole grant cycle. We do okay. it all over Fantastic. every two years. So you're just given a 2% mid-range bonus. And I'm sorry, there's one other clarification. Are, are, are we... Are we keeping the local critical need fund in your motion? From Down from what I, I've heard, yeah. <laughs> but from what I've heard, this is really, yeah. Let's do that. Okay, thank you. Thank okay, you. so <laughs> I, thank you, Jamie. I, I, I jumped in here because there's ideas that are being floated, and I see where you're coming from. Um, I've been through two iterations of trying to evaluate how we give out money. Uh, going back to my participation in FAC and Bobby Gunn and Mike Tomini was involved in this. So um, I also agree, and I think all of us are well aware that notwithstanding a study, we're going to have to be the ones to make that decision. And from my earlier experience, and you've had that experience what you're telling us about, and you're also telling us other communities have had this experience, it's not an easy way to go. So what I said when um, Kristen first brought this proposal for it and I gave the final vote to support her was that there are times when we have to sit back and reevaluate. And it's not an easy thing to do because so many agencies depend on this money. And it is true, and I've been on a board of one that works on these things and every single little dime or dollar is very important. The stories that we heard earlier that the salaries aren't as good as they should be to even afford adequate housing. So we could go and talk about these situations, but we are also the holders of public money and we are responsible, at least from my standpoint, to look at programs every now and then to figure out if they actually meet the needs of our community. Our community elects us so that we actually meet the needs that are the ones they feel every day, the ones that they want us to address. And as a city council person for Capitola, that is my first duty. And I want to address the needs of Capitola residents. When we get to the decision-making process, I think we also have to mention, and I think Kristen sort of talked about it, that the needs of Capitola are not necessarily singular and stand alone. So our needs also depend on the community around us. And I think that should be part of our process also. 
So it was already mentioned by Ed that when we do start this process of getting a survey going or a study going, we will be part of that process to set the criteria and the framework for how that moves forward. That probably won't be five of us talking, maybe a separate committee, which has already worked to get this process going. So those are some of my thoughts. Um, one thing that I think is particularly good about this, you know, I did have a talk, uh, Nikki's gone, I think, but did have a talk with Nikki and the whole idea of a strategic plan to try to figure out how the park and rec program is gonna move forward to meet the needs of this community and in particular focus on children. I think heretofore our programs that we have right now in the park and rec district aren't as focused on children as I would like to see it. Yes, we have an exemplary program, Go Tola, but there's a lot of other things that I think we are not addressing. I'd like to have after school programs. That's one that I think is very important. But I'm looking for Nikki, who's our new person in charge of the Park and Rec District, to come up with a strategic plan based on her experience, because she's been working in the field, working with kids for a long time. And so I think anyone on a city council should give their support to someone that we've recently hired to come up with a plan to meet those needs. And so that's why I'm in favor of this proposal. The two things, a strategic plan from Park and Rec and a study to help us, but not make the decision, but to help us come to a point of systematically identify the various needs of this community in concert with the fact that we're part of a larger community but we're also responsible directly to the voters of Capitol. So with that, I'd like to call for a vote. Council Member Story. No. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Botorf. Aye. Mayor Bertrand. Aye. So we've done direct staff measure J. We've done community grants. Um, I thought the second one was gonna be the hardest one, and that is direct staff regarding Measure J revenue for business groups. Determine a split between BIA and Chamber if we need to. Direct recipients on how to develop a budget that allocates marketing and community improvements. And direct staff to return to future meeting with proposed budgets for funding BIA and Chamber. Um, Boy, <laughs> so uh, we're gonna be out here about one o'clock. <laughs> so I just wanna let everyone know. <laughs> um, would anyone, does anyone have any, well, first of all, I'd like to set the, the conversation going. I think that um, we just spent a long time trying to figure out how we are going to allocate funds for children's groups. We've been doing that for many years now. We've had programs for children. We've been allocating programs for uh, community, prog um, community, um, community recipients, um, 501c3s and stuff like that. We've been doing that. But we've never before started to take public funds and allocate it to private groups. We've given money to the chamber. We've had wonderful programs with them over the years but now we're expanding that to the BIA. So I'd like to put it out to the board before we start the conversation that we probably should require more of a dutiful approach to this because I think the city of Capitola and its residents want to know that public funds are being spent adequately and to the best benefit of this community. And especially now that we're giving it to private groups that are in profit businesses, I think this is particularly important. So I'd like to have comments. Ed. Yeah, I'll, I'll start it off, I'll try to get, get us through this one. Um, this is new money, and, and so, um, yeah, I think our allocation, correct me wrong, city manager, I believe the chamber already receives, is it 30,000 a year? Okay, and, and we anticipate that this is gonna be a 30,000 semi-annual or $60,000 a year, so to keep it simple, I think that uh, for the time being, we should uh, determine the split between the BI and the chamber should be 50-50. That would be my recommendation. Um, 
determine that the recipient direct the recipients to develop how the budget budget allocates I think we need to challenge the, the two organizations the, the the Chamber of Commerce and and the BIA to, to, to tell us how they plan to spend the money uh, I don't really want to dictate to them I think the the premise that, that you pretty much touched on was is is you know the BIA for example I think they want to use some of their money for marketing and I don't have a problem with that I mean it's pretty much where they they sponsored us and measured J and supported us and and that partnership says that uh, they want to use some of that money for for marketing that's fine but the the the, the, the other statement we made was an, an inclusive thing like it would in, include village enhancements or um, or uh, other elements okay so one thing is is uh, that I, I would consider a village enhancement is when they go out each year and they spend four or five thousand dollars on Christmas trees that would be okay that would be something that they could say to us and I would typically like to see some kind of a budget of, of, of the money we give them where between 25 percent and uh, you know one-third is spent on enhancements and then allow them to use the other money as they see fit for their marketing whatever and when it comes to the chamber it would be the same thing you know uh, you know maybe a two-thirds one-third and and I already see that the things that I think that the chamber does that might qualify as enhancements for the village or events like the Easter egg hunt the uh, surfing Santa um, the Halloween uh, parade okay so I, I don't think it's gonna be difficult it's just a way of wording it and I don't even know what the exact budget is but um, Tony thanks for staying so late sorry about that but um, so I would direct them to come back to us with the budget of how they plan to do that and uh, you know in the village you know the, the one thing that's in, that's in contention right now is that the village made an effort to buy lights and a good bad or indifferent they the, the lights were an enhancement okay and and to me things that enhance Capitola can either be of a permanent nature like a light or it could be of a temporary nature like hiding Easter egg candy so I'm, I'm real willing to call it enhancements or other elements that uh, that's how I'd look at it and direct staff to, to return to future meeting with those yeah so that would be my thoughts on that so you basically you're saying you'd like to have a better understanding from the two groups how they propose to use this money some is already pretty well well they got to submit a but I want them to submit a budget I mean okay. the, the budget is, is to include that they plan to use the money we're giving them for the intent that we distributed to them we, we said we want some enhance was the term enhancement is that what the ballot language was it's actually budget. Okay. Community improvement. Community improvement. Com marketing and community improvements and, and improvement like I said I, I just want to expand it in my mind improvement as it relates to the chamber could be like you know the events okay improvement doesn't necessarily be something tangible like like a light fixture or a Christmas tree it could be an Easter egg hunt like yeah whatever whatever okay. I'll let them submit so those are my thoughts yeah I see Yvette's hand up um, and I'm in, in agreement I I agree that the chamber should utilize the funds for marketing and development for community events such as mentioned the surfing Santa and Easter egg hunt um, and then the BIA should utilize their budget and if it's a two-third one-thirds for you know what you said or a 50 50 BIA should utilize 50% of their budget on marketing and then the other 50% on community improvements just as mentioned in that ballot language earlier or the two I don't that's not the right math but or the or two-thirds one-thirds however we want to move forward and that the budget should be presented I agree that the budget should be presented to council for discussion and approval um, so the sense I get is that this is not a carte blanche in either case they come to the City Council to get approval for whatever that budget is there may be some discussion on that budget at that point and then we will either approve or send it back to the respective group I think we need to give them some parameters on what we expect though I think we, you know I, I think a 50 50 would be maybe too much to ask I, I don't think that's reasonable I, I in my mind I envision that somewhere between 25 and 33 percent of their allocation should go back towards the city the rest their will to do with what they want and when I say city it, it's those it's a pretty broad spectrum if we tell them they can buy Christmas trees for example is a something they already do it's not like we're trying to but I think that between 25 and 33 percent is a reasonable ask to reinvest in the city this is a yearly amount they get uh, you know they'll be getting 30,000 every year so if they put 10,000 back in your city improvements okay 
works. Um, do I hear other comments? Sam? Yes. Um, my understanding from the staff report that the BIA has already submitted uh, an amended budget. They, do, they did submit a, um, a draft budget, amended budget, but like I Which said, we're working through their contracts. I was going to bundle those together, and then I wanted to wait for council direction tonight. Off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. Right. I think they had about 5,000 of their addition for sure. enhancements. Right. So, I mean, just they've already um, have a plan, um, and um, we should just um, invite them or have it submitted to us so we can evaluate it along the lines that you mentioned, Ed, um, and discuss it then. Yes? My, my suggestion is, is is to take advantage of this hearing, I think, and to give them some direction, because they, they submitted that, I think, without the ad advice of council, and it would be, I think it'd be easier to, for them to come in with a budget that's consistent with council direction rather than come in one that maybe didn't meet your expectations. But Well, I, well, I mean, I assume that They've heard the comments, and they know what the Measure J says, you know, concerning marketing and community improvements. Um, and um, they can either, I mean, if their current mid-year budget amendment for 17000 if it falls within those lines, that's fine. If not, they can take it back and make some appropriate adjustments. I don't think so. we've established any percentages, Sam. I think that's what we need to do is, is give them some expectation of us as to of the um, allocation how what percentage would we like to see them reinvest into the city yeah well I thought you spoke to that very well Ed though about certain range um, and I you we know even put that I mean I'm fine with the range right I, 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 I don't know that at this point I wanted to you know like strictly say oh it's 50 50 and you gotta live with that because yeah. I think it is truly about you know how do they see their what are their needs how do they perceive them and how do they want to present them to us and uh, um, and so that, and they can maybe follow the directions and give a better sense of, of success when it does come here. Um, but I don't necessarily want to tell them how to make their request to us. If I may, is it, uh, would it be reasonable for us to essentially ask them to come back for a budget with language saying the council strongly suggests that you use 25 to 33 percent of your funding on whatever this may be so we're kind of putting the guidelines out there for them saying please stay within this but then if they come back and say no that doesn't work and here's why we we can consider that yeah it may be even simpler we just say minimum of 20 we don't have to put the range just say minimum of 25 percent we suggest please, please show us a, a, a we, we recommend a minimum investment of 25 percent annually okay i i would like to step in here um i brought this up a number of years ago and um i know that because I was a merchant, president of the merchants group for many years, and I always thought the city did not provide enough for us in our particular area. But I know that the city of Capitola provides a lot of services to the BIA downtown. And I would actually like to see the city, uh, the city come up with an accounting of about how much we provide now we clean sidewalks, we do policing, we do the roads, we pick up trash, we do a number of things. And I would like to see that figure out there so that the business community actually understands how much the city contributes to the well-being of that area. And then we can have a discussion about what more can we do using this new fund I want to start with a base level, and that's the important thing to me. I don't know if um, other city council members agree with that, but we've been doing a lot for the city down by the Esplanade in the center of the city, and, and that's a very important thing to, to do, and I don't think anyone has a problem with that, but I want this to be a two-way street here. I want this to be understood that we're all helping each other and I want it to also be understood that there's been a lot done that is continuously being done to support the Esplanade and the business community downtown. And when I talk to people sometimes, I get the impression that there's a lot of complaints about how the city responds to the business needs in the community in our Esplanade and the center of our city. And I totally understand that because I was in that position once. 
but the city never came to me and said, this is what we do, and this is how much we actually spend on you, and I think that's an important thing to level the conversation. And I agree that we need to say to the community that, uh, B, uh, excuse me, the BIA, that how much are you doing for the general good of your area? And so I think the city should tell us, tell them how much we're doing to the general good of their area. So how much is the business community doing or are we gonna ask them to do for the general good of that area? So that's my input on that. If I'm there's a motion, I'm I would prepared, like to I'm see that. I'm prepared to make a motion. Okay. I'll make a motion that uh, we, uh, the split between the BA and the chamber to be set at 50-50 <laughs> and the, the uh, direction to on the budget is direct uh, the chamber and the BIA to uh, show a minimum 25% investment in, uh, what's the term, improvements and enhancements. Improvements and or enhancements. Community improvements. And uh, have them return with budgets for, uh, for our approval. I'll second. Okay, um, I'd like to make a friendly amendment, if I may. I'd like to also uh, add to that that we direct city staff to come up with an accounting of how much the city spends on the, B, uh, excuse me, the Esplanade area, the central part of our city, as part of that discussion. If I may, I would take issue with that. Yeah, I think I, it's our responsibility yeah, as a city to do those things, yeah. um, take care of our roads and, and whatnot. And so to ask them to, to show us how much we're doing for them already is kind of, I don't know, I think that's our job is to do those things. I, I would agree. I, I think that that it is our job, and I, and those discussions have come up, and it's not a good way to have a relationship. I think we're doing it. This is a positive thing. We're we're allocating them money, and we're just asking for some simple accountability of how they spend it, and so, and what we do for them. We are in the business of providing services, as Councilmember Peterson, and so I, I I'm not going to accept that from the amendment. That that's something you can ask the city to give you at any time. That I think that information is readily available, but I don't I don't think it's pertinent to this conversation. Yeah, I, I could see the sentiment behind uh, your comments and Kristen's comments. I just want the discussion to be a level playing field. And yes, the city does provide uh, resources, but sometimes it's not always appreciated. And I think it's important in any kind of relationship to have an appreciation, um, just like the police department depends on the appreciation of the people in the city for their services. That helps for effective communication and the and effective providing of those services. I think the same thing applies to the merchants. I think we need to have a better relationship with the merchants so that there's communication so we could share these things and appreciate each other's part of that deal of helping each other out. And I, I, I'm not sure that I see that here. I'd ask we call the question. Call the question, please. Are we going to, uh, well, I Yeah, roll call, please. We have not had any public comment. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. Public comment. My, my, I see, I, Tony, yeah, if you'd like to, you know, sorry, oh. Tony. I came here for direction tonight. Hmm. I, that's why I did not submit anything yet. <laughs> so I just wanted a clear understanding of what you know the chamber should submit for our funding request. And you know the last couple of years I haven't had to uh, provide anything. So I'm glad we are going to be providing information to you uh, as to what we do with that funding. And um, just some more information for you. We work hand in hand with the BIA. We have since it was established. So we're working in partnership with them no matter how much funding they get and how much funding the chamber gets. We still work together on promoting, you know, the Capitola Village. But the chamber uh, goes past that. It's just not Capitola Village we promote. We promote all of Capitola. 
So in my report to you and my request, I'll submit all that information as to what we're, what we're doing. So I just wanted direction tonight as to what to do. And you got it, right? I got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for everything you do, Tony. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so let's have a roll call vote. Councilmember Story? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Botworth? Aye. Mayor Bertrand? Aye. So with that, we are moving on to approve overall mid-year budget amendment. And um, can we go over what those are? Because it's been so long ago. <laughs> do wait, wait, do you want to revisit? Just to clarify, yeah. All, it was all the ups and downs that, that yeah. Jim summarized in his presentation, and it's included uh, in the attachment to your- I, I do your remember them. Do people want to hear those again? No, yes, no, no, okay. Uh, in the interest of moving along, I don't think we need to hear all those. Um, do I hear a motion? I'm gonna say go to the sheet. We may be able to wrap up everything. What's, can you go back to the other sheet? Oh, you do, okay, sorry. <laughs> Is there two or one there? Two arrows up. Motion to approve mid-year budget and authorize staffing changes. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So we have budget amendment authorized. Okay. We're almost done. Let's see. Mid-year budget. Oh, my God. We have item C, consider resolution ratifying the state division of voting. And I think Steve's coming up. Boy Royce grant application. Staff report. Sorry, Jim. You're going to have to get up. <laughs> I'll make this quick, <laughs> Mary Council. Uh, really quickly, uh, Measure F funds were identified when we campaigned for Measure F to do improvements along the waterfront, spe specifically to the wharf, the flume, and the jetty. Um, the flume and jetty project is ahead of the wharf project. Uh, we have plans that are about 90% complete right now, and we're just waiting to get uh, the last of our permits that are required from it. We do have Fish and Wildlife and the Regional Board permits. We're waiting for the core permits, which we anticipate next month, and we are on the Coastal Commission uh, agenda in April to get that permit. So that will give us all the permits we have. Um, one of the things when we talked about Measure F was always trying to use that money and uh, get grants. Um, we did find a boating and waterways grant that um, will pay for, uh, to help stabilize beach erosion. Um, we've talked to them and our flume and jetty project matches nicely with what they're looking for. Um, there was a grant deadline to submit the grant uh, February 1st. We, Public Works met that deadline. And as part of it, they do want a resolution from the council um, submitted to them by April 1st uh, that basically says you ratify the application and you request the funding. Um, if the city's application is successful, the funding will not be available though until June of 2020. That's actually when they'll make the award and it'll probably be, take us a few months to get the contract together. So um, that is it, you know, a year, year and a half out. Um, under the application, we requested $800,000, which is about approximately 50% of the project cost. It is a grant match, so whatever we get, we need to match with them. Um, project timing, the, uh, once we have all the permits, uh, we're really only months away from being able to, re to put the project out to bid for construction. Um, the, the, Project construction does need to occur between November and April. That's when the flume is not in use and we're gonna be, you know, needing it dry and to do that. So right now we're kind of on a, a trajectory to build it this November through April. Um, it won't take that long. It's probably only a six week project, but because of the, you know, you're building in winter, you don't know what storms we'll have. We do have this long window. Um, so currently, as I said, the current schedule is to go out to bid as soon as we have the permits and construct it this fall. If we do wait for a determination uh, for the grant, it would require delaying most likely until winter of 2020 when we go to construction. Oops, sorry. Um, just, I think I blew it. 
I really did. Sorry. I guess I'm tired too. <laughs> Excuse me. So our recommendations tonight are to consider two options. You have to do either or is to approve the resolution ratifying the application and requesting funding from the State Parks Division of Boating and Waterways and direct Public Works to schedule the Flume and Jetty project for construction as soon as practicable from any decision on our on the grant application. What that means is th the grants are getting app reviewed by different staff members at different times and from what we understand, um, they can get kicked out at any time. So if we get kicked out and six months from now, we can try and move the project forward at a different time if we wait until June 2020. Um, the other option is to not adopt the resolution and just direct you to proceed with the Flume and Jetty project um, as soon as we can and construct it this winter. That's it. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Any comments? Uh, uh, Sam? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Steve, is, is there one, uh, you said that we may not hear about the award until maybe June 2020 is is then that and if that's the case um, there would still be I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is, is there some middle ground between this where we could maybe start you know since it's a match um, and um, and at the time that we hear about the award um, then I mean yeah we would we would be able to use that the 800,000 uh, apply expenses to that um, uh, at that time. So in other words, can we bridge uh, the work uh, and fit in this grant at a later date without delaying too much the start of some of the work? Well, just the way th the timing of the project having to be built November through April. Right. We can't start it this November because we'll complete it before June of 2020. We'll, it's only, like I said, a <clears throat> six week project. So we can't start it this winter. And so in reality, if we, by June 2020, we'll be already in line for the November grant. So I, I, I don't think we can complete part of it. The grant won't reimburse us for any expenses prior right, to yeah. the, the date of the contract. So. And, and, and is that also true for the jetty portion of the project? Yes, it's one project so, in here. Right, yes. all of it. So, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, first question is, if, if we apply for the permits, uh, my question is, is, is how long do the permits last and how expensive are the permits and does applying for the permits negate us from receiving the grant? Is there any advantage to, to applying for the permits but not going ahead with the project? No, so we are clear with all the permitting agencies that um, we this project could be delayed for various reasons why we're waiting for other. We originally planned to be in construction right now. Right. We only got two permits. So all the permits are good through 2020. That, that's really what you're asking. Right. I, I mean, if we, and are, they, are these permits expensive? I mean, is this a, a large? Oh, we've probably spent. Um, because of the necessary coordination, especially with the core, we've probably spent, I'm gonna say $30,000 on okay. them so far. So it, it's, it's a sizable sum, but the thing is, is these permits now would allow us to postpone this. They'd still be intact, we'll wait for this decision in June, and even if it, it came in June, we wouldn't be building it until November anyway. Right. So it, the timing might even be better. And, and the other question is, is do you perceive this, the, 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 the status of the jetty or the flume to be imminent where we couldn't wait the two years? No, I think, you know, they've been there for 40 or 50 years in each, okay. and I think they're fine. More questions? I uh, do have a question, um, a little off topic, but what's the status of the uh, wharf project? So the wharf project, we are waiting for a historical evaluation to be completed. Um, as we know, it's an historic, it's registered. So I'm gonna have to just briefly interject. Um, oh, sorry. Not on the agenda for this evening's discussion. Plenty of stakeholders would probably like to be here for that. Thank you. Um, without mentioning what I just mentioned, uh, the public did pass this resolution for three different projects, um, wharf, jetty, and
flume, and we're putting off working on two of them, and I think the public would like to see some progress on the money that we've been collecting, so that's why I brought it up. Okay, um, any questions from the public? No questions from the public. I'll bring it back to City Council for motion. You know, I, I'm thinking that there's a large degree of fiscal responsibility here. I mean, we have an opportunity to possibly uh, get an $800,000 grant. Um, I know that we uh, have been, you know, applied for a, a grant on Claire's and very unsuccessful because it wasn't a worthy project. So the fact that, uh, you know, I'm hearing the language that this is a, a worthy project and one that they like, I, I don't think it uh, behooves us to move ahead with this at this time. There's, there's no eminent projects we have, and I'm willing to wait and uh, whatever the scrutiny of the public is about us not spending the money, I think they'd much more appreciate if we uh, try to uh, secure 50% of this funding. So I'll make a motion that we go for uh, uh, the first option, approved resolution ratifying the application requesting the, uh, the flume project. Uh, oh, wait a minute, is it? Yeah, it's the top one. Yes, top one, I want the top recommendation that we wait and see if we can uh, secure this grant. And should it fall apart, so we need to bring it back. As it should have fall apart. We can just move ahead as planned. Yeah, and we're, we'll come back to you before we go to bid. You okay. guys need to approve the plan okay. and the project okay. anyway. That, so. that would be my motion. All right, I second that. Second. Okay, motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, with that, adjournment. Thank you. Almost exactly a 10. <laughs>